Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel and welcome if you're new here, my name is Mo. And you were like, what is this behind you? This is not an episode of Criminal Minds. This is not a Mike's Mike video. You can tell by the title of today's video, today I am trying to explain the plot of The Secret History to you. The Secret History is my favorite book. If you know me, you know I talk about it a lot. I've also done some TikTok commentary on it if you want to go over there and follow me. And I figured, why not try to explain it to you guys? So if you wanted to read it, you didn't have to listen to like 100 pages of Donna Tartt describe Vermont in the winter. And you didn't have to listen to like a 28 hour audiobook. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Got a feeling it's gonna be a long one. A quick little intermission before we get into the video. This is my collab with Fru York. It is the Return to New York pendant. We have them in silver and gold, and they're both restocked. You guys sold out the first initial stock that is insane. I think this is the first time that I'm mentioning this collab on my channel. So, yes, linked in the description and in my bio's on all socials if you want to go buy it. Love you. Okay, bye. A little bit of story before we get into the actual explanation of the book. Secret History is a fictional novel by Donna Tartt, who's also the author of Goldfinch, which you might have heard of. Notoriously long. Notoriously long. But it was inspired by her own time at Bennington College in Vermont, where she also studied with a very famous writer that we might have known. Did this little known book, like not too popular or anything, not too crazy. There's actually a dedication to him in the opening of the book. And one of the characters is said to be heavily based on him. He must be a very good sport because the character that's based on him is very interesting. It starts with our protagonist, Richard Papen. When the book opens, Richard is actually 28 and he's talking about all the things that have led him to this point in his life. He proceeds to tell us, you know, basically about his childhood. He grew up in a place called Plano, California, a small Silicon Valley in the north with his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Papin. We don't know much about them except for we do know that his dad's kind of like a jerk, um, kind of like hothead and his mom is kind of just like there she doesn't really do anything really ever his dad owns a gas station and his mom works at like a call center answering phones Richard basically describes growing up in plano as melancholy and disposable as a plastic cup he basically talks about from the moment he was born he knew that he didn't fit in there and that he wasn't gonna live there he did however try to go to community college there where he was a pre-med major because he wanted to make his father proud and also because he did not want to take over his dad's gas station because he does not want to live in Plano. Richard literally hates his parents so much that he proceeds to introduce some more characters in our story which would be Charles and Camilla McCauley. They are twins and they are orphans and they were raised by their grandmother in Virginia. Richard literally says <laughs> that he's jealous of them, that they're orphans. He's like, at least that's mysterious. At least that's cool. It's better than your parents just being poor and they don't like you. Also introduces us to someone named Francis, who you will learn about later, and says that he is the result of a fling between a rock star and a 17 year old girl. So um, there's that. He was raised by his grandparents alongside his mother, almost as if they were siblings. And lastly, he introduces us to Bunny, who had what he describes as a typical all-American childhood, grew up in the suburbs, multiple siblings, blah, blah, blah. He says that literally he could not have less in common with them if he tried, and the only thing that they had in common was their shared love of Greek and the year that they spent together in college. Which is funny because, like I said, Richard is studying pre-med because he wants to make his parents proud, and the only reason he ends up taking Greek is because he wanted to sleep late on Mondays, so he just decided to take whatever class was available. He tried to do pre-med for two years, and he was just like, no, I'm not doing this, I hate it. So he didn't tell his parents, and he switched to English literature, and he said that he liked it better. One day, he comes home, and he's just like looking through his old backpack and high school stuff and he finds a pamphlet for Hamden College, Hamden, Vermont. I don't know anything about Hamden. <laughs> he literally just sees the pamphlet and sees how beautiful it is and that it's like the opposite of Plano. So on a whim, he decides to apply and he actually gets in to his parents' dismay. They are not happy about him wanting to leave Plano and go to this expensive school, which is interesting because Richard lets us know that when he applies for scholarships at Hamden, they actually say that his family's contribution more than his father wants to contribute. 
leading us to believe that Richard is probably not honest about his parents' wealth. One thing you have to know about Richard is this man is a liar. He got liabilities, okay? This is the definition of an unreliable narrator. And not only does he want everybody that we're going to encounter in this book to like him and to be impressed by him, he wants us to be impressed by him as well. So we're taking everything that he says with a grain of salt. But anyways, after months and months and months of arguing with his parents and going back and forth, he finally just steals some information out of his dad's desk and he ends up at Hampton. And he literally says, and I quote, to this day, I do not fully know the chain of events that led me to Hampton College. So he's like, this is some fate, this is some Greek mythology, this is like, like, someone play Hercules soundtrack, you know what I mean? Richard gets to Hamden and it is everything and more that the brochure made it look like. He said that he is in love with his dorms. They're described as a white room with big north facing windows, monkish and bare with scarred oak floors and a ceiling slanted like a garotte. Um, whatever that means. <laughs> he spends the first couple days just exploring the campus and staying in his room and he's just really happy. He feels like Hamden is just the place for him and he's excited for classes to start. He goes to see this little guy all the way up here, probably gonna have to zoom in on him. George Lafont ends up being his French teacher as well as his academic advisor and Richard tells George that he wants to take Greek as his language because he studied it when he was in school and he actually got an award in proficiency for Greek at his community college in Plano. So he says. George is like, um, that's nice that you want to study Greek and all, but it's impossible because there's only one Greek professor and he's very, very, very particular about who he lets in his class and his name is Julian Morrow. This is my fan cast for Julian. Are you in the comments if you won't? So then Richard's like, um, how can a teacher be like, I'm not taking students, like isn't this a college? Like isn't what this whole thing is about? And George is basically, yeah, Julian's built different. He's super rich and he doesn't take any money from the college to teach. He says he takes like a dollar for taxes for something for some reason. So because of that, he basically does whatever he wants to do and nobody questions it. Orch says that although Julian is very specific, that Richard should kind of expect this type of thing at Hamden. All the professors here kind of operate on their own time. They're obviously, with the class being even more elusive, Mr. I want to be that guy so bad is like, oh, I'm definitely, definitely getting into Julian's class. George is like, he has five students. Good luck. So Richard is like, okay, I need to go ask this guy if I can be in his class. So he goes to the registrar and he's like, where is Julia Morrow's class? And she's like, oh, it's in the Lyceum. You can't miss it. It's the only one up there. He likes his privacy. Lyceum is cool. Sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right. It's a Greek name. There's tons of Greek in here. Tons of little Easter eggs. If you're knowledgeable about Greek mythology and Greek history, then you will know this is just another name for like a learning center. So he goes and he knocks on the door of the Lyceum and Julian is like, hello. And he does not open the door. Like he barely opens it enough for Richard to be able to see his face. And Richard's like, hey, I want to study Greek in your class and I'm from California and everything. And Julian's like, oh, sorry, there's no room. And he just closes the door. And Richard is like, okay, now I really, really, really need to get in this class. Cause he is like, he's not pissed, but again, he has a morbid sense for the picturesque at all cost. Richard, he's there, right? He doesn't have any friends yet though. So he's asking people around, making acquaintances, and he makes sure to ask about Julian to almost everybody. Like, tell me what you know about Julian, tell me what you know about his classes, basically trying to get the info. Julian is somewhat of a mystical feature novel as well as on campus. Um, everybody has a story about him that he's used to be a princess's tutor, that he knew Marilyn Monroe, that he was on the run from a government before, all these types of crazy things, but nobody really knows anything solid about Julian. He's also obsessed with the other students. And this is where we meet the rest of our classics class. Like I said earlier, we have Charles and Camilla McCauley. They're twins. When Richard sees them, he actually first thinks they're dating which remember I told you that, and he describes them as a pair of Flemish angels. Also says they stand out from everybody else because unlike the rest of the group, these two always dress in white. Next we have Edmund Bunny Corcoran, Francis Abernathy, and the one and only Henry Winter. 
It's really funny too because when Richard is describing them, he is basically talking about them like he's David Attenborough in the wild. He talks about Francis and he's like the fieriest mop of red hair you've ever seen with great coats billowing behind him. It's about Bunny just being this like jovial all-American man and he talks about Henry as if he just saw God himself walking across the campus. Henry is everyone's problematic fave. He's the broody one. He's kind of like the leader. Super handsome, super, super rich. That's another thing to know about all of our people. They are very, very rich, very wealthy, and they are not anywhere near Richard's tax bracket. Although they are all varying levels of wealth. Another week goes by and Richard is still figuring out like, how am I gonna approach these guys? What am I gonna do? He's like fascinated, but he also is like trying to convince us that he's not low-key stalking them, which he totally is. But Richard's in the library and he's chilling and he overhears Bunny and Charles, Camilla, and they're having a very like esoteric, repetitive argument. They really can't figure it out and Richard, of course, Mr. Creeper is over here eavesdropping, so he's like, hey, what if you use locative? You know, what if you use this version? Like, it's, it's kind of archaic, but you know, it would work and then you would just have to put X, Y, and Z and you're done. Bunny and Charles and Camilla are like, who are you? But the answer is actually right and they write it down and like, okay. Bunny's like, that works for me. Charles is a little bit more hesitant, but Bunny's like, thank you, I should shake your hand, I should shake your hand and he's all obsessed with Richard because he just did it with solid. So Henry comes in, he sees them all sitting down and he says hello. And he's very standoffish, but he does eventually say hi and acknowledge Richard's presence and introduce himself. The others tell him that Richard just solved the problem for him, and Richard's like, yeah, I study Greek. And Henry's like, surely not at Hamden. <laughs> and Richard's like, yeah, no, like, obviously not. He's like, okay, locative case. Henry's kind of impressed by his answer, and he goes, uh, very Homer. Like, do you like Homer? Like, are you a Homeric scholar? And Richard wants to lie, but for some reason he feels like Henry would be able to see through him. So he goes, yeah, I've read some Homer. And Henry just gives him this death glare and he's like, I love Homer. Let's go. I get up to leave to go to class, but Bunny is like, hey, you, just, you did us a solid. So why don't you come and talk to Julian again at the Lyceum? And I think he'll have a different answer for you. Like, I'll put in a good word. And Camilla is like, oh, that was you the other day that came to the door. Like, And then you find out she was in there in the private lesson with Julian. So Richard is kind of like, what the hell, why were you in there? And also, thank you, thank you, question mark. But Richard is like, finally, 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 I got what I wanted. So after the conversation with the students in the library, Richard goes to talk to his new boss, Dr. Roland. Dr. Roland is a psych teacher, and he's basically like a senile old man. He repeats himself all the time, and he's just kind of the head of Richard's work study, because again, Richard needs a job, he does not have money like the rest of them do, so he has to work and there's not many jobs, or little to no jobs at all, honestly, in the town. So Richard is like, I wanna be in this Greek class, but they all dress like Interview with a Vampire and I don't have any money, so I'm gonna ask Dr. Roland for an advance on some money. He goes there and he asks Dr. Roland, and Dr. Roland is like, I'm not giving you any money. And Richard, being the little liar that he is, is like, well, it's from my car. Doesn't even have a car. And Dr. Roland, being the senile old man he is, is like, oh, it's your car? Oh my gosh, okay. And he starts telling him all this stuff that he needs to get done, where to take it, and he gives him 200 doll hairs. Richard is acting like this, $200 is two bands. He is gas. And he's like, I'm going into town, I'm getting what I need to get, and I am going to buy some expensive clothes, because if I'm going to be in class with these people, I'm going to need to look the part. So Richard, he goes into town, and he's like, should I go get some food? Should I go see a movie? And he's like so overwhelmed with having the ability to spend money that all he does is end up going to the thrift store, and he gets like a good jacket, some gold cufflinks, some nice just stuff, you know what I mean? That looks relatively lived in, so it'll look like it's been his for a while. So the next day, he's like, okay, I'm gonna go talk to Julian, I'm gonna try this one more time. So he knocks on the door of the Lyceum, and to his surprise, Julian opens it wide, and it's like, come in, oh my gosh. He makes a joke about Richard's last name being the same as some kings of France, and he's like, oh, do you have time to talk to me? And Julian's like, I always have time. 
for people if they're related to kings of france and richard doesn't get the joke so he just like lets him in <laughs> and he's like okay so one thing you need to know about julian is he is almost like a collector of sorts okay the more unique the more interesting you are the more intrigued he is they're all kind of like his shiny little possessions he has a pair of orphans that are twins he has francis who is a rock star's illegitimate child Henry Winter, the brooding, mysterious, ultra-rich boy, and Bunny, the all-American Greek scholar. So when he meets Richard, Richard is like, I need to sell him. <laughs> I need to sell him on this. So he starts deep diving into his life in California, and he basically says that this is all a lie. And he's actually from LA, and he talks about growing up rich, going to the Beverly Hills Hotel, being around movie producers, all this, and Julian is just sitting there, hanging on every freaking word. Julian's like, I don't know that many people from California. Julian is so impressed that he is like, all right, well, I would like to invite you to study Greek and to study it in my class. And Richard is like, yes, I have literally come to this school. I did the impossible. I'm in with the cool kids. This is the group everyone wants to be part of. Everyone fears them, everyone loves them, everyone watches them from afar. I'm so cool. Then Julian is like, but you have to do one thing for me. And Richard's like, huh? And Julian's like, you have to drop every single class you're taking and take them with me. And Richard is like, huh? And Julian's like, well, actually you can keep French because if you're gonna study Greek, your modern language needs to be proficient. And Richard is like, I can't drop out of Hamden College into your own little college of five because I am on scholarship, but he doesn't want to say that. So Julian is like, don't worry. They know me here. They know the kit. They know the caboodle. Just take these transfer ad drop forms, do what I say, and then come back for class. There's a brief moment where Richard actually thinks about declining the offer because he realizes from now on, almost all of his classes will, will be taken with Julian. So he is going to literally transfer out of Hamden College into a little college of five to six people. Richard is like, okay, I'll do it. And he goes to George Lafort and George is like, this is not a good idea. Trust me, you don't want to do this. No student should ever just be taught by one person. It's not good for you. And also Julian is not the person that you think he is. But ultimately Richard's like, you're just jealous. He's probably your enemy. I'm joining the Greek class. So the next day is Richard's first day in the classics class. And on his way to class, he sees Francis and he's actually trying to avoid him. But Francis stops and waits for him to catch up. And he's so excited. He's like, hi, like, you're the new student. And Richard's like, yeah. Francis looks at him and says, Cubitum imus, which is Latin and Richard does not speak and it means will you sleep with me? So Francis is one testing Richard's knowledge and two testing are, are you straight? You for the gays? You for the girls? You for the days? What you into? But no what he says and the conversation just kind of like awkwardly ends and they go into the Lyceum. When they enter the Lyceum, Bunny is kind of messing with Henry and getting under his skin because Henry went and bought a Mont Blanc pen, which is like a $200, $300 pen. And it's because Julian has a cup full of them on his desk. So Bunny is like, you want to be Julian so bad. You're such a little kiss ass. And he's like, hey, Richard, what's your preferred pen? And Richard's like, I did not even know a world existed where there was preferred pens. So he just says ballpoint. And Bunny's like, ballpoint. I love it good old all-american standard can't go wrong so at this point richard's kind of feeling bunny kind of feeling the twins francis is a little he doesn't know what to make of him and he definitely is steering clear of henry now that henry realizes richard is in their class he's basically grilling him and he asks him about plutonius and all these other greek literature um figures that he's read and richard lies and says that he has read some things that he definitely hasn't and he's like i definitely think henry saw through me but bunny basically interrupts and okay henry enough you've raised him over the goals you've given him the fifth degree give the kids some space so then at this point charles comes over and he's really nice to richard and he's just introducing himself and he's like how are you doing all of this stuff and then boom julian enters and says one of my favorite quotes in the book and says i hope we're all ready to leave the phenomenal world i hope we're all ready to leave the phenomenal world and enter into the sublime richard is now in his first class with julian and he is just fascinating 
Nathan, okay? He is watching this man like he is God himself, and he notices that all the other students are hanging on to his every word. And the Lyceum is gorgeous. It's not a regular classroom. In the book, it's described as having tea sets and Moroccan pillows everywhere, lanterns, vintage chairs and cabinets, books and busts. Um, there's a little kitchenette, there's framed paintings. It's basically beautiful. It's like an entirely different world outside of Hamden. So Richard is like, he is living life right now, okay? He is like, this is everything I wanted. He's just very pretentious. He talks about having a girlfriend in California and not liking her because she was a pop psych version of Sylvia Plath and not a real stoic brooding pretentious twat like he is <laughs> conversation that he has with julian talks about how the classic mind and the modern mind are very different and how the classic mind is very narrow very unrelenting and very obsessive and he says although i can digress with the best of them i'm nothing in my head if not obsessive and his fatal flaw is a morbid longing for the picturesque at all costs so he is in his element and camilla is like the little apple of his eye Keep that in mind. So Julian is talking about ancient civilizations and he's talking about one that basically drove their people mad because they turned up their inner dialogue too much. What does that mean? Well, basically he's saying that they made them too much of themselves and they made them think about themselves too much and too introspective and it drove them mad. I relate. And then he says because of the dangers of our minds and how we can lose ourselves in them, apparently that's why we need war. <laughs> so that's why the ancient Greeks and Romans loved to fight a lot because they were freeing themselves from just sitting around and thinking. And then we have this really foreshadowing, foretelling scene where Julian kind of talks about how because they have studied um, Greek battles so much that they would know exactly how to march on Hamden Town and take over the town and Henry kind of says how they would do it with the twins going and blocking off all the entrances and Francis and Bunny kind of helping to funnel everybody into the town square where they would then do what the Greeks did. Talk about that and Julian's like but 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 in all reality as much as brutality is necessary there are beautiful moments in even war and he asked Camilla to read a passage from Kavanestra's which is just a story about Agamemnon and just some ancient Greek stuff and she does and when she's reading Richard is like this is my future wife yep she's the one she's the one he is just enraptured and you kind of get the vibe that almost every boy in the class is enraptured with Camilla. Camilla is extremely interesting because like Donna Tart, she is the only girl in her classics class but we know the least about her because we are always told about her through Richard's perspective and like we said Richard's a liar so I don't think she was ever failing him but keep in mind he loves him some Miss Macaulay. So after Camilla is done reciting the passage Julian is like amazing stunning 10 out of 10 and he goes what if that was about war and death and all these things why did it sound so beautiful? Eventually come to the conclusion together as a class that it is beautiful because beauty is equal to terror and whatever we call beautiful we quiver before it. The point about this lecture is actually important to the overall message of the book because what Julian says after that is that things that are typically ugly or grotesque in real life frequently become beautiful in art and when we go forward with this book you will realize that although this is a beautifully written book there is a lot of really dark and disturbing things that happen so much so they catch you off guard because it is set intentionally in such a beautiful place all the settings except for the hippie house which we will see later are described as just being beautiful idyllic like out of a Thomas Kincaid painting type of thing. It's almost the end of the first day and Richard is like my mind is blown I am a changed man. Julian's like you know Beauty, death, terror, life, all of that, c'est la vie. Really, men only want one thing, and what is that? And nobody has an answer, and Bunny says to live forever. So, remember that. So, they take a quick tea break, and they go on to their next lesson, and Julian is talking about Christian madness, okay? These are, Dionysus is the ancient Greek god of wine and partying and so many other things, and he is known to have these rituals that are very, very feral. Things that I can't really say on YouTube, but do Google at your own caution. And Julian is just talking away, just jibber-jabbing in a way about all the things that they did. And Richard, 
Richard's like part fascinated, part horrified. He talks about the mysterious nature of the madness. He says it's difficult to intellectualize because it basically involves you as a person reverting from a human or modern life to a primitive way of thinking, which, okay, just bear with me. Basically, Julian thinks that it's important that really smart people confront this uncivilized, unintelligent, sort of animalistic thing inside of them because they do the most to repress that animal side in day-to-day -day life because they're very intelligent and they're very smart and they always want to seem dignified. If you don't confront that madness, then it will lead to outbursts of violence, which is why these rituals are super violent because it's expressing all this this anger at one time or whatever, okay? But you're just like fascinated and horrified and he's literally like, if the rest of the college knew what we were talking about in here, you would be gone, sir. You would be done. Tenure or not, you're out of here. So after class, Richard is like, wow, my mind is blown. He is walking out of there like he just sat in a Brene Brown lecture. He's heading to the post office to send a postcard to his mother, which is how you know he's feeling inspired because Richard really does not like his parents. On the way there, he stops because he sees Bunny putting something in his mailbox. And he's like, huh? What? So he goes and as it turns out, Bunny had written him basically a letter that's like ineligible because Bunny has the worst handwriting and he is inviting Richard out to lunch to welcome him to the class and to thank him for saving their butts when it came to that translation in the library the first day. Out, he runs into Dr. Roland, he makes up a lie about his car, Dr. Roland's so senile he doesn't even remember what was wrong with it so Richard's lie just flies by and he is just high on life right now. He got away with his lie. He got into Julian's class. He's in Hamden. He's away from his parents. Everything is great. Dr. Roland has this colleague called Dr. Blind who doesn't play a really big part in it, but he's kind of like the deus ex machina always saving Richard from Dr. Roland's rambling. So he comes and they leave and he's like, okay, I need to get ready to go to meet Bunny for lunch. And Richard's just like, how do any of the people in this school teach and get away with it? Like, Dr. Roland should not be teaching. <laughs> and Julian, like, is he even a teacher? He's just loving life. So Richard is all gassed for his lunch for Bunny, but then he realizes he has nothing to wear and his mood is instantly soured. He does have a coat he got from the thrift store, but it's way too hot. It's a uncharacteristically hot day. So he's like, that is not gonna do. But this is the type of place and the type of man where you wear a jacket to lunch. So he goes in the bathroom and he's panicking and he runs into Judy Poovy. Miss Judy P, I have a soft spot for Judy, I love her. She is a fellow Californian and one of the few that is at Hamden and she's like total valley girl. And Richard is like, hi Judy. And she's like, hi Richard. Really wants to like be spicy with Richard, thinks he's cute, always wants to hang out with him. He's not interested. He's like, I like the Camillas of the world, not the Judy Poovies. So Richard tells Judy that he is in the classics class and Judy is like, girl, why would you do that? And proceeds to say how she doesn't like Henry or Charles and Camilla. And Richard is like uber defensive. Mind you, he's known them the same amount of time as he's known Judy. He's been friendly to him every time, cannot say the same for all of these guys. But he's like, you don't know them, okay? And she's like, yeah, well, one time I was at a party and I was super messed up and I was like jumping around head banging because everybody was and I accidentally hit that little girl, Camilla, and she was so mad and I turned around and I threw my drink on her because that's what you do when you're at these parties and people will piss you off. All of a sudden, the freaking twin was in my face like he was going to beat me up. Like he was going to hit me, like a man was going to hit me. And Richard is like, huh, that's really weird. Like that doesn't seem like Charles at all. And then Judy's like, well, it gets worse. Okay, do you know my friend Spike Romney, who was not on the board because he got expelled from Hamden, but Spike is basically just like this big, tough, like, greaser dude. And Richard's like, yeah, I've heard of him. He's very scary. I would never want to see him in a dark alley. And Judy's like, well, he started to stand up for me, and Charles started to try to fight him, and then out of nowhere came Henry and just went ape berserk and broke Spike Romney's collarbone, to which Richard is baffled, awestruck, and shookington bear because Spike Romney is scary. It's like, okay, these people may have a little secret. Richard is at this point where everything intrigues him. He's, he's always interested to find out more. He's 
Curiosity killed the cat to find. So he's talking to Judy about how he's going out to lunch with Bunny. And Judy's like, oh, I actually love Bunny. He's actually really sweet. I know him, we're friends. I'm shocked to hear this because one thing about all of the kids in the classics class is they tend to only hang out with each other with the exception of Bunny. Bunny has several friends around campus and he's always off doing something. But Judy is finishing up her story and she notices what Richard's wearing and she's like, aren't you gonna be hot? And he's like, yeah, I don't have anything else. She's like, I'm a costume design major. Come with me, I have something for you. He gives him this jacket and he flips over the label and it's just this beautiful Brooks Brothers like linen blue jacket, nice and silky. And he's like, Judy, you literally saved my life. Love you to death. This is amazing. Thank you. So Richard is like, Ever since I came to Hamden, my luck, I have like a horseshoe up my butt. Bunny picks up Richard in a cab, he immediately compliments the jacket, but then he's like, mm, this is like maybe okay for California, but this is a little too light here. Like I know it's warm today, but it's not spring yet. I think you'll learn about Bunny. He is prone to negging. He loves to give you a compliment and then give you an insult. They pull up in the taxi and they go inside and it's beautiful. One of the nicest restaurants Richard has ever eaten at. And he's like, oh my God, this is a casual lunch for him and he's treating me, these people are filthy rich. So they go in and Bunny is like, yeah, no worries. I made a reservation. Um, I actually know the maitre d', we're friends, but he's not here today, whatever, I guess this will do. And they're walking through the restaurant and Bunny makes Richard super uncomfortable because he says something um, like homophobic and he basically just says that gay people love to work in restaurants and the waiter a disgusting face and bunny does not care <laughs> like he seemed like richard says basically bunny didn't notice that he offended the man or he didn't care that he offended the man and he's kind of like okay interesting noted but he's not really saying anything yet richard is not one to rock the boat we're at lunch and bunny is basically like hey how often do you go to the polo lounge it's the nicest restaurant in la and richard basically is like not much despite the fact that he's literally never heard of it because he's never been to la he basically is like huh that's weird seems like your dad would love the polo and he just like brushes it off and he starts to tell him how him and all of his brothers went to this really nice bougie bar for their first drink and it's like a tradition in their family and he also says that he went to the Oak Bar, which is the bar they go to in the tradition, without his dad one time, and he ran up a huge bill and then left without paying. Came back with his father a different time, and he was super freaked out that they were gonna snitch on him, but all they did was add it to his tab, and thankfully his dad was so drunk that he did not notice. So, Richard is like, friends, rich, check. So Richard is like laughing this off, and Bunny again is like, oh, here comes Twinkle Toes, in reference to the waiter. And Richard, once again, is not comfortable with this, but doesn't say anything despite the waiter frequently being offended. Bunny is oblivious to everything around him at all times, and he just orders an extremely gaudy drink with <laughs> cherries and like, freaking paper umbrellas on it. And he's telling Richard how he first tried this when he was in the Bahamas or sorry, Jamaica, and he's like, have you ever had this? And Richard is like, no, I haven't. And he changes the subject to ask about Henry. So Bunny's like, yeah, I like Henry, he's cool. You know, we were roommates our first year. He's a really nice guy, he's really hard to live with. Um, he doesn't really like to have fun. <laughs> he's like, Henry just likes to read, he stays at home, he knows seven languages and can read hieroglyphs. And Richard is like, what? Holy shit. Holy shit. He's even more infatuated with Henry than he was before. Richard is like, wait, so where is he from? Like, what, what's his deal? And Bunny's like, oh, he's from Missouri. And Richard is like shookington and he makes a face and Bunny laughs. He's like, what? Did you think he was from somewhere exotic, like in a cast? Richard is just so, like, he has such idealized versions of these people in his head that the idea that Henry would be from somewhere as regular as Missouri is just bizarre to him. He talks about the winters we don't know much about them we will see them later on in the book briefly but he basically says that henry is super quiet about his home life and he does not share he's never met henry's dad met the mom one time their new money thinks that the dad does construction the mom's pretty she's rich etc etc so bunny's like i don't want to talk about henry though i want to talk about you what does your dad do and richard is like well my dad has oil money <laughs> And Bunny's like, what? And Richard in his head is like, well, technically we own a gas station, so we do have oil wells. Because Bunny's like, you have oil wells? And he's like, well, we have one. So he doesn't feel like he's lying that much. He doesn't feel too bad for lying to his new friend. And then again, he brings the conversation back to Henry and says, 
how was Henry so smart and where did he come by his intelligence? Bunny basically says that when Henry was a kid, he was in a really bad accident that took him out of school for a long time. So he had no choice but to read and write and he was bed bound. Again, the waiter comes by just bringing them food and drinks constantly. And this time Bunny actually says um, a slur and basically says that you should round up all gay people and Salem witch trial them. Um, at this point, Richard's like, okay, yeah, Bunny's, this isn't just like a passing comment, like, Bunny's a bigot, like, and he's like, well, what about Francis? Like, isn't Francis gay? Because Richard looked up what Francis said to him in Latin that day, and it translated to, will you sleep with me? So Richard's like, something something he's like absolutely not francis is not gay and he changes the subjects asks richard if he has a girlfriend and richard says no i don't bunny's like well i got a girlfriend and that girlfriend is marion is this picture of amanda Bynes in easy a because that is the perfect example of marion she is an education major very waspy and bunny refers to her as a real girl he says that he prefers his girlfriend to someone like camilla who lacks a mother's firm hand which richard is like her parents died so okay that's kind of rude as soon as their food comes he brushes it off and he's like whatever and he starts to eat just running a bill up at this restaurant they're eating and drinking and bunny's just ordering round after round after round and bunny's like oh my gosh we've literally been here for hours they're closing this was so much fun old man which is what he calls richard he goes okay let's get the bill Burr. so the waiter brings the bill and he's like disgusted and he just drops it on the table basically because he's like i'm not getting a tip from this guy and bunny goes oh i forgot my wallet i can you spot me this time and richard's like uh you invited me to lunch at your treat like how much is it he's like it's 300 something dollars and richard is like 300 dollars I, I don't have that and Bunny's like come on come on you got it and Richard's like I really don't he's like well why don't you just put it on a credit card and Richard's like I don't have a credit card so Bunny kind of gives him this like weird look and he sizes him up and he's like don't worry old man don't worry and he gets up and he goes to the back he's like I'm gonna make a phone call and he calls boom Henry and when he comes out and tells Richard that he called Henry and Henry's on his way to pay for it Richard is flabbergasted he's like Henry doesn't mind paying for our meal we just ran up a tab and didn't invite him and he's cool with it and Bunny's like yes oh my god he has more money than he knows what to do with like Henry is my man like he is on his way everything's fine Henry gets there everything is not fine he is super annoyed Bunny cannot take the temperature of a room ever and Henry just kind of wordlessly picks up the check tips the guy and is like let's go so on the way back, they are just in the car and Bunny's just jibber jabbering, not reading the room. And Richard is like, I want the ground to swallow me whole. And Henry is like, I hate my life. So they drop Bunny off and Henry is dropping Richard off. And he goes, I'm so sorry. That's a nasty trick. He pulls it with us all the time, but I never thought he would pull it on strangers. And Richard is like, what do you mean? Like, I know Bunny is not the most, you know, delicate person, but it's okay. He just like left his wallet at home. And Henry's like, he didn't leave his wallet at home. He intentionally does this. He takes it that everybody he's with is rich and can produce all these sums of money at any time, which is why Bunny was questioning him and when his eyes lit up when he said that his dad had oil money. And Richard is like, no, okay? And he's kind of annoyed because he doesn't want to feel like Bunny got the one up on him or he okie doked him. And he's like, he forgot his card. And Henry's like, didn't you guys take a taxi there? And Richard's like, yeah. And Henry's like, who paid for the taxi? Richard's like, and he distinctly remembers Bunny pulling out money to pay for the taxi. So he did not forget his wallet at home. And he indeed tried to trick Richard into buying him an expensive lunch to see if Richard was another rich friend to add to his roster. So at this point, Richard is kind of like, okay, that was really weird. I'm not really feeling Bunny right now. I'm kind of off this. The next day, Charles and Camilla come up to him and they're like, hey, do you want to go on a walk? You want to hang out? And he's like, sure, let's go. And on the walk, they start talking about the lunch with Bunny. And Richard is like, are they friends? Like, do they get along? Do they like each other? Because in the car ride, Henry was not speaking to Bunny. He was like over it. Charles and Camilla are like, oh my gosh, what? Yes. Henry loves Bun. He has no problem doing it. He's not mad at you. They're best friends. It's just like a thing between them. And Richard is like, um, okay. Even though they are polar opposites and seem like they hate each other, 
every time they're in the room, I'll take your word for it because I'm new here. And not much really happens in this scene. They see an old cemetery from the 1700s and Camilla's like, wow, it's beautiful. Like, you should go there sometime and like explore. The fence, they see three ravens and Charles just laughs. He's like, I wonder if that's like an omen and they walk back to campus and that's basically all that happens in that scene. At the end of the walk, the twins invite Richard over to dinner and he is like, oh, at first he declines because he's like no 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 because he feels uncomfortable with the idea of being under pressure and under scrutiny but eventually he says yes because they're like listen it's no trouble for you to join we really really want you to what i find interesting about charles and camilla is camilla's name actually means acolyte helper to the priest and they are also twins dressed in white symbolic symbolic we see it tart but what i find the most interesting and what we learn later on in the book just remember that these two the twins dressed in white were the ones sent to get richard to initiate him into the group remember that for later so richard is like okay i'm gonna go to dinner with them and he goes and they're really nice they're just like asking him about the other people on campus if they know anybody from california and richard brings up judy poovy and he realizes very quickly that Camilla does not like Judy and Camilla is irritated that he even jokingly brought Judy up. They say that Hamden College is a perfect place for Judy because it is the last place on earth for the worst people in the world. <laughs> they are half joking but they kind of honestly believe the idea to be true because they use Henry as an example. They tell him that Henry is actually a 10th grade dropout who never took his SATs and no college would have let him in if it wasn't for Hamden. It's interesting and they never really explain why or how Henry got into Hamden but I digress and during this conversation Richard is like okay you guys are low-key making me nauseous this is like some privilege privilege and all the whiskey and drinks he had at lunch with Bunny are kind of coming up and he's like ugh, I want to leave. But before he can leave, who comes walking to the door? Bunny and Henry. And he realizes, good golly, Miss Molly, this is a group dinner. And I low-key have been ambushed into hanging out with everybody. And he is not doing good. So he goes to the kitchen for a glass of water. And he's kind of just like sweaty and not feeling good. And Charles is cooking lamb. And Richard is like, this lamb is making me nauseous and I just want to leave and he's so overstimulated and so anxious and he is just like this is not fun which is sad because it's his first group hangout with these people that he's been dying to be friends with and it's kind of the first inkling that you get that like being around them not everything is as it seems he's already had this terrible lunch with Bunny and now he's having this dinner where it's just like bleh, disgusting he's searching for some aspirin because Henry who is prone to migraines remember that for later can tell he has a headache so he's like okay i'll get you some aspirin and bunny is being super loud and annoying again never taking the temperature of the room and stealing lamb chops out of the oven bunny bites a lamb chop and there's like pink raw juice that comes like dribbling down his sleeve and he's like i am just disgusted he leaves early to go home but not to go to bed he says because he is straining to remember exact words telling inflections any subtle insults or kindness he might have missed so Richard is literally like, I gotta get out of here because I need to go home and dissect every little thing y'all said to me and whether it was a positive, whether it was a negative, and if I need to move accordingly. And he is real for that. So the next day, Richard goes to the Lyceum and he is late, he is hungover, he is sweaty, and he gets there and Bunny is there chipper, dandy, looking like he didn't go through anything and he's kind of like making fun of him for being late. And Julian walks in and the class is quiet and Richard is like, damn. I messed up last night because everybody is kind of acting standoffish and cold to him and they're doing grammar today so he's literally just like translating things and he's like okay this isn't mystical this isn't magical this is hard and this is boring and everyone's kind of just like icing him out and he's like wow I transferred out of my big college into this college of five and now there was a opening in their armor a chink for me and I missed it and I am screwed. At this point, Richard is like, dude, I think I made the wrong decision and maybe George LaForge is right and maybe I should not transfer into this little college of five and he's just regretting his decisions. Over here is Henry and Julian talking and Henry goes, should I do what is necessary? And Julian says, one should only ever do what is necessary. And that's kind of like, okay, intriguing. He's spying on them and it's like, what this conversation about? 
But then at the end, he said that Julian leans in and gives Henry a quick little business-like kiss on the cheek, of course, and walks away. And Richard is like, what in the hell is going on? Now I can't leave because once again, his curiosity has been piqued. He needs to know what's going on. He's like, there's more layers to this. I need to stay and I need to investigate. But after seeing that interaction, Richard is just like, what did I get myself into? And he's kind of just in this depressive episode where he basically stays to himself all week and he's like, this week it just sucks. He's like in a haze, just his mental health is not doing good. So he decides to go to a party where he knows Judy and some other people will be. And the main thing is he knows the classic students will not be there because they do not party with people on campus. So Richard is there and he's just chilling, you know, he's just drunk, vibing, doing his thing. And Richard is outside at the party and this girl is like talking to him and she's like, oh my gosh, you're in class with all those freaks, those devil worshippers. And at this point he's drunk so he's like getting defensive and he's like, they don't worship the devil, you weirdo. And she's like, yeah, well, Seth Gattrell, this kid that I know, says they're all evil. And Richard is like, how does Richard is just like, well, how does Seth Gattrell's girlfriends get all those bruises? Y'all don't say anything about that. And the girl is kind of just like, oh. and Richard's like, and another thing. And before you can go in, boom. Now goes back, who is it? Miss Camilla. And she's like, hey, what are you doing? Do you want to get out of here? Francis has a house in the country. This is where we get introduced to the infamous, the beloved, and the mysterious country house. Um, a lot of the book will spend time here and a lot of major events happen at the country house. A lot of their bonding and other things happens at the country house and the way it's described is beautiful. Richard is psyched. He's like, my girly pop came to take me away for the weekend. And he realizes I am dumb. This country house is their last trump card. And Richard is like, as much as I have been watching them, they've been watching me. And reminder, Richard has been like trying to be sly. So he's been ducking around corners. When he sees them coming, he hurries up and walks away. So they're just as intrigued and weirded out as him. Like, why do you want to study Greek with us? And why do you, why are you so nice in class? But then anytime we see you outside of it, you're like, see no evil, hear no evil. So they drive down in a convertible Mustang and Richard is just like in a dreamland. He's with Francis and the twins. And he's like, oh, this is a house? No, this is a castle. Pull up to the country house and he's like, oh my God, this is a huge, huge, huge Victorian house, beautiful, sprawling. There's a lake. Um, there's said to be like a... a dome for worship there's a cottage house there's it basically everything they can need a tennis court and francis is like yeah it belongs to my aunt but you know she didn't want to sell it so our family can just use it whenever we want and they give him a tour and he hears some piano playing and boom it's charles sorry did i say charles was in the car with them he wasn't he was already at the country house it was just these two and richard is very strategic because they're like to me do you like women do you like men what can we do to entice you to come to the house? I personally believe they sent Camilla and Francis, but keep that in mind. So Richard, to his delight, realizes that not just these two have invited him, but Bunny, Charles, and Henry are also there, and they're all staying the weekend together at the country house, and Richard is like, yes, I made it. I am part of this group. This is when Richard says that for the first time, his memories, because remember, he's 28 when he's telling us this, and this happened when he was 19. His memories start to, like, appear clearly. Like, he remembers everything distinctly and clearly from this point on. And he says that for the first time, memories appear in shapes like their very bright old selves. So once he was fully accepted, he was like, okay, this day marks the rest of my life is just beloved by everybody it's like their safe place sometimes julian will even come up there and they will make him dinner um it's huge so there's just all these little rooms there's like an old horse-drawn sleigh in one of the garages that camilla loves to read in with blankets and everybody just has their own room and he just is in love he's like i just want to live here forever so the next day henry and camilla take richard out on the rowboat in the lake henry is rolling them out and he's just quoting t.s Eliot's the wasteland and 
very important. And Richard is just like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so he's fascinated. And I just spend some time on the lake and Henry and Camilla are definitely like very flirty and Richard is like pretending like it's not happening. Keep that in mind. And they go back and everyone's playing cards and they're playing Go Fish because that's the only game that Bunny Corcoran can play. So Richard falls asleep and he just had the best day ever and the next morning he wakes up early and he goes outside to find Henry translating Paradise Lost by Milton into Latin for fun. Richard is like why are you doing that? And Henry's like, I don't know. Henry's silent for a second and he just gives Richard this look and he's like, you're not very happy where you come from, are you? And in that moment, Richard is just really happy to not be asked about his parents or Plano or his past and the fact that Henry could read his uncomfortability with his life before Hamden and kind of gave him this way out. And Richard says in this moment, that's when he developed a love for Henry. Basically, Richard goes on to say that the time he spent here with his classics class really made him who he is and gave him the personality he has today. Knowing Richard, he probably just stole all of his favorite parts of each person and put them into one. He also talks about Bunny and Marion, and he says <laughs> that Marion, who Bunny never brings around the other classic students because they don't get along, and Bunny fight a lot, and Bunny will come to Richard's room to hide from Marion, and she will come and be like, if you don't come out in five minutes, I'm leaving. And I'm going to bed in 20 minutes, the door will be locked. And Bunny will kind of like make some excuse to pretend that he's not going to Marion's. No, 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 I'm just gonna go home and sleep. I'm gonna go get a drink. But Richard knows he's always running back home to Marion's. There's a whole bunch more scenes at the country house. There's a scene where Henry and Bunny are playing croquette, and Charles and Richard are watching, and they're talking about living there forever, and Charles is like, what are you doing for the next 40 or 50 years of your life? And it's one of my favorite moments in the book. Charles and Richard kind of watch them play and Bunny wins and they just kind of fantasize about what it would be like to live together in the country house. He talks about how Henry might not even graduate. He just likes to learn. Um, at one point in the novel, Richard is shocked to find out that Henry doesn't even know people have walked on the moon. Like he's very withdrawn from modern society. He doesn't care for his family, so he is enamored with this idea of them never changing and he talks about how they will all live together and never move grow up or get married this line where he says they will never do any of the treacherous things that friends do after college also julian comes to dinner in the country house and richard laments in the future that it was such a stressful big ordeal every time he would come and they would go all out and they would decorate and they would camp candles but on the rare occasion that he would come it would be amazing and he would always give the same speech that he heard Camilla give when Bunny gave the answer of live forever. Out of their little motto for this group, live forever. Keep that in mind. <laughs> so Richard, again, he's kind of just reveling in his past. He's kind of telling us really and like having this revelation to himself that he spent so much time with them but he knew very little of what was happening towards the end of term because this is where the novel starts to take a little bit of a turn and Richard starts to address where the cracks begin to form in their little pantheon and he says that there are plenty of things they didn't let me in on and would not for some time. In retrospect though he talks about how there's tons of clues and little signs and things that he missed eventually used to put together what is going on but he also talks about the fact that he was blissfully aware to them or maybe so intentionally, which Henry will call him out on later. When he talks about clues, he doesn't really give any specific examples, although he does talk about this one time that Bunny and all the others were together and Bunny started to burst into the song Farmer and the Dell. That was nursery rhyme and he realized everybody was super uncomfortable and bothered and he was like, hmm, that's interesting noted. He also noted that after the weekend they would come back to class and they'd have random injuries and he hadn't seen them all weekend. They were like really obsessed and like preoccupied with judging the weather and learning about the weather. He's always like hearing, overhearing weird conversations. He recalls when he hears a strange conversation about the twins. The twins are talking about bed sheets and how to make them into chitons, which is a type of old Greek dress. You know, you know, togas basically. <clears throat> is toga appropriately correct? I don't know. Let me know in the comments below. And he talks about blackish water on the stove, which Francis claims was for a bath, even though it smells really disgusting and it's kind of, kind of like a potion -y thing. And he's like, what are y'all doing? Like, are you cosplayers? Like, what's going on? So again, the spacing of this novel is kind of hard because Richard was just talking about something that happened to him in the middle of the story. So they're still at the country house, but he ping-pongs back and forth between present, past, current perspective, old perspective, present tense, past tense, so kind of got to keep up, but they're still 
at the country house. Dude wakes up and he walks outside and Francis and Bunny are drinking prairie oysters which are a disgusting concoction of like eggs, Worcestershire sauce, and like a whiskey and you shoot it. Prairie oysters, really disgusting. Shout out if you ever had those. Not to be confused with Rocky Mountain oysters. If you know, you know. So they're drinking those and Francis is like, I cannot do this. And Henry and Richard are like, we're not drinking that. That's disgusting. And Camilla, again, she's always itching to do something. She's kind of getting bored. And remember, they have a lake over in the country house. So Richard and all of them suggest, why don't they go take a walk by the lake? So Francis, Richard, Camilla, basically everybody comes except for Bunny. And all of a sudden, Camilla screams and then blood just begins to appear in the water all around them like it's looking like the birth of jesus christ and they're like what is going on she lifts up her foot finds out she put a shard of glass in her foot and she cuts an artery everyone is like standing like stunned because she's just gushing blood but henry okay doesn't even miss a beat and he scoops her up and he orders Francis to get the first aid kit and the tourniquet and he's holding Camilla in his arms and he's like comforting her and Richard is like what is what is going on and instead of acknowledging how much Henry is overprotective of Camilla this man gonna say something the moment was so beautiful it looked as if it could be a painting yeah Richard's Richard's something so Charles comes down and he literally yanks the piece of glass out of her foot the excitement of the moment is kind of broken afterwards Francis and Bunny take Camilla to the emergency room together I always thought this was such an odd pairing but Francis says he feels like he needs to go out of obligation and Bunny says he wants to go because he missed all the excitement <laughs> which Bunny and Richard are I mean, they're not foils, but they kind of exist on the same plane, just on separate spectrums. Maybe that would make them a foil. I always thought it was super interesting that Francis and Bunny went to take Camilla to the hospital and that Richard did not make a note of it. We're just watching. The day is over. Everything's winding down. And he's watching Henry and Bunny play croquette. And he's talking about how they're laughing and having fun and how this day was almost perfect. And he ends it by saying, the laughter haunts me still. We're like, okay, um... <laughs> Whatever that means. I thought these were your friends. Why are you haunted? And you slowly start to get these pieces fed to you by Donna Tartt where you're like, okay, something's going on. Thing wicked, this way come. Something in the buttermilk ain't white, as my grandma would say. Chapter three has us at the end of the semester, okay? And what we know about Richard and the Papins, y'all already know he is dreading dreading going home to Plano. Also, he doesn't want to go home because he doesn't have any money and he's going to have to ask his parents. And one thing we know about Richard, as we can see, he's surrounded by all these extremely wealthy friends but has never once asked for a dime. His pride is verging on insanity level. He also talks about his parents becoming friends with this couple called the McNats, who are like this childless couple. I didn't put them on here because they're not important. But basically, his mom and dad become friends with them and Mr. McNatt is always criticizing Richard and kind of putting Mr. Papin down and it causes Mr. Papin to be very overly aggressive and yell and kind of try to put Richard in his place to like prove his masculinity and he's just like, I'm not dealing with that. Also, he lets us know that his mom, the month that he left her school, had written and let him know that his bedroom was no longer there and she had turned it into a sewing room. She said, I'm not even waiting to see if you like this college, you gotta go. All the while, Richard is wondering, where will I live? How will I survive winter in Vermont? Henry, that's Henry, Henry and Bunny, on the other hand, are planning a trip to Italy. Now, they've been talking about this Italy trip vaguely throughout the semester. He had never really paid too much attention to it. He never thought it would come to fruition. But as it draws closer and closer to this semester ending, he realizes that Henry and Bunny are in fact going to go to Italy together. The trip with Henry and Bunny, I think, is one of the most pivotal moments in the book, especially what's going to happen to Richard and everything while they are gone. So this is where you really gotta pay attention, folks. Henry and Bunny going to Italy. The twins, they're going home to Virginia to work for their uncle's law firm and live with their grandma. And they invite Richard and Richard is like, well, I would actually love to go, but what about a job? And he is kind of like not so subtly trying to get them to offer him a job um, at the law firm or somewhere in town or kind of give him a lead of where he could find a job and they're just not taking the bait because they're just oblivious to the fact that anybody would need money even though the twins aren't exactly as well off as everybody else. So Richard is like, okay, this is a bust. I need money if I want to keep living the lifestyle I've been living so I'm gonna stay and work with Dr. Roland for the semester. The only issue is Francis 
is going home. He also invites Richard to come with him, by the way. But again, Richard needs money, so he does he declines. And Francis's apartment is being used by a young cousin. He doesn't know if Henry's apartment is empty, and he is too scared to even ask Henry. So that is a bust, and he is like, what am I gonna do? I can't afford an apartment. I can't stay in Hamden. I'm gonna go instead live in this hippie house. What is the hippie house you ask? Richard gets kind of like a word of mouth recommendation that there is a hippie on the other side of town that lives and owns an abandoned warehouse and if you will work for him and make mandolins for him then he will let you live there for free. So Richard is like okay I've never done this before but I've never done any of this before and I successfully weaseled my way into everything I want before. I'm sure I can shave a couple mandolins. I'm sure I can do this. So he plans to stay on with Dr. Roland and live in the hippie house. The only issue is he doesn't have a car. <laughs> like I said, Richard's pride is crazy. He asked anybody to borrow the cars. He can't tell Dr. Roland he doesn't have a car because he's already lied to him about needing the money. So he decides to walk back and forth every single day in the dead winter in upstate Vermont. Richard has this plan to stay in the hippie house and because he knows that he's not going home and he's staying in Hamden, he's just trying to be as normal as possible for the last couple of days while everyone's still here. He doesn't want to let on to his plan. So he talks mostly about Bunny paper he had on John Dunn. He's just kind of like mocking Bunny and saying this paper was terrible and ironically enough, although it was the worst paper that Bunny had ever written, it ends up getting in People magazine after Bunny passes away. So now back to the prologue, the snow in the mountains was melting and Bunny had been dead. We now know this paper specifically gets published after his death. So the paper is about Dunn and Isaac Walton, whom Bunny argues are connected by this thing called metahemeralism. If you listen to the audiobook, the way that Bunny says metahemeralism is so Funny, everyone tells Bunny the paper is literally trash, but he just does not care. And he's like, at, like, metahemeralism, you gotta get it. And Richard's like, I don't even think metahemeralism is a word. And Henry's like, it's definitely not a word. Our final product, and it's so funny. He shows it to Henry and it's like triple spaced with huge font. And he's like, yeah, it kind of looks like free verse, right? And they're like, no, it kind of looks like a menu. <laughs> and they're kind of roasting him. And he's like, no, no, they're going to love it. Richard reads the ending out to us. And it says, as we leave Don and Walton on the shores of metahemeralism, we wave a fond farewell to those chums of yore. They're all like, Bunny is not passing <laughs> this paper. He is not passing with this paper. He's definitely going to fail. But that is the one that ends up published. So Richard finds that little quirk to be funny. The next couple days is basically just everybody leaving Hamden, packing up. Richard is in his sulking era because he knows he is like about to go live in this abandoned warehouse and he doesn't even know what's waiting for him. The twins are the last to leave and he sees them off and Camilla basically throws her arms around Richard and Richard says, I've never seen anyone so maddeningly beautiful as she was in that moment. He is in love with her. Whether or not it's because he actually loves Camilla or because she is this idealized version of a woman or because getting her would mean he's the one that ended up with the only girl in the class he won. He's the top dog. I will never know. After they leave, he's just on campus and he just says, I am alone and unhappy and this is as dark as I've ever felt and he just goes to his dorm room and goes to sleep. So Richard has to evacuate the premises. Okay, anyways, packs up what little he has and he starts walking. Yep, he is walking to the other side of Hamden. And this is interesting because we see Richard talk about the gradual growing blight and rundownness and unhoused people and all these things that he starts to see. He makes his way from Hamden Town to the outside of the city. He leads him to a place called Prospect Street in East Hamden where he has never been and he realizes that East Hamden is a lot different than Hamden Town and the wealth disparity is large. He also sees this biker bar where he's like, I'm so hungry, I need to use the phone, I'm just gonna stop here. And then he remembers that this biker bar is notorious for people like there, so he's like, yeah not gonna go there and he's walking in the snow okay you guys this part of the novel is a little hard to get through because donna tart really really digs in to that cold vermont winter snow and really lets the chill sink in your bones but alas he's walking he's walking he's walking and he comes upon boom the hippie house what used to be a thriving warehouse is now basically a rundown shell of a huge mansion house type of thing and richard is like what 
did I get myself into? So Richard meets the hippie and he, Richard meets the hippie. He is not a nice guy. He is like, dude, I don't want to talk to you. Let yourself in, go upstairs, shave my mandolins and call it a day. And Richard is looking around and there's just trash everywhere. There's garbage. And then he climbs up some very rickety stairs to the room that he's supposed to be sleeping in and boom, there is a big hole in the ceiling. And it's funny because you flash forward to Richard in the present talking about how stupid it was to stay in an abandoned warehouse during one of the coldest times of the year in upstate Vermont. Taylor Swift, now that I'm sitting here thinking it through, I've never been anywhere as cold as you. Richard also lets us know, future Richard, I'm gonna start calling him that, also lets us know that in retrospect, Future students brought space heaters, cook heaters, blankets, you know, things they were going to use. But Richard did not think to bring any of that because, again, he's not from where it ever gets cold. And he also says that the hole in the roof is a new addition, so nobody told him about that. To combat being there, he spends a lot of time working with Dr. Roland. And Leo, the old hippie, is just off doing whatever he wants to do. And anytime Richard sees him, he's angry. And he's like, you don't spend any time carving boards. You just want to live in my warehouse for free. And Richard doesn't really feel bad because he's like, dude, this is not a warehouse. This is like a shell. And Leo actually has a nice room that has like a heating and all this stuff. And Richard is like, I'm going to try to fix this hole. And he tries to fix it. And he falls down. He cuts himself. And he has to get a tetanus shot. He's working for Dr. Roland. Every day is the same thing. It's about Richard trudging in the snow. And this part of the novel, he's just kind of getting beaten down. Like all his walks back and forth, his morale is getting lower and lower. He's getting cookies and postcards from the twins. And Bunny sends him a letter from Rome. They're asking, like, where are you staying? Where are you living? But he's not replying and he writes whenever he gets a chance the commons of the university where he spends most of his evenings because he dreads going back and it's so interesting because dr roland is a psychologist and he sees him every day yet he cannot notice the decline in richard's mental health and also richard starts showing up earlier and staying way later because again he is unhoused in the cold and dr roland is like oh my god you're such a great worker it's such an interesting point that donna tart highlights how like everybody just ignores basically in the psychology department that Richard is like withering away. Richard is really down at this point. He's walking home and he looks at this like beautiful frozen river down below. He contemplates, you know, should I just like take my life? Should I keep doing this? Like what should I do? And he, he pushes forward but makes it home and that night he's like, I did not know if I was going to make it. It was so cold. So he goes back into town and Dr. Roland is like, oh hey, like I, I saw your friend. Like he was walking around and Richard's like, I don't have any friends. And he's like, I saw your friend. He was walking around, the big one. Great big boy, he wears glasses. So remember, Dr. Roland is not the sharpest test. So Richard's like, okay, Dr. Roll, okay. Richard is so down bad and sad that he does the one thing that lets you know he's really on the edge calls his parents so he calls his parents from the payphone and his dad answers and his dad is just like bitter and angry you know what i'm not dealing with this so he just hangs up eventually it gets so cold that he cannot stay in the hippie house anymore and he stays in a low budget roach motel on the other side of town and he is the only resident in this motel outside from the person that owns it one night though <laughs> he's sleeping and the handle starts to turn on his door and he screams and freaks out and he's like who's there Richard decides he would rather risk freezing to death than sleep in the motel and get shanked or something like that back to the hippie house he goes no it's February okay he's been in the hippie house for about a month but February cold is if you ever live somewhere where it's cold, February is normally knocked down, drag out, freezing. Richard is starting to get delirious from the cold, okay? He is not doing well. So Richard is walking through the snow and he is like, I am not gonna make it. And he thinks that he sees Henry. Remember Dr. Roland said your friend with the glasses, he was walking around, dee -de 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 -de. And Richard's like, Henry? And he's like, no, I can't be, I'm crazy, this ain't it. So he goes and he works for Dr. Roland and Dr. Roland says, hey, I'm gonna be gone for a long weekend and that means Richard is not gonna have anywhere warm to go for days and days and days on end and Richard is like listen I'm gonna freeze to death halfway through his walk and he is like I'm so fucking exhausted I can't do this he stops to use a payphone to call a cab to take him to the hippie house and he's so out of it that he goes to put the quarter in swabap bashes his head on the edge of the payphone falls to the ground in the dirt and snow and he's literally just laying there bleeding out and he's like this is it but he gets up and he's like all right whatever and he's all bloody and he just starts walking just walking walking back to the warehouse and when he gets to the hippie warehouse who does he see but mr henry 
winter himself. Henry is really excited to see Richard, but he quickly takes in his condition and is like, whoa. And before Henry can even get up, Richard begins to fall and he kind of just his pants and he blacks out. When Richard comes to, he is in the hospital, of course. And Henry tells him that he came back from Italy early and he's literally been looking for Richard to find him, but nobody on campus knew where he was staying and he didn't leave a forwarding letter. So he had just been tracking him. Richard explains, you know, I was just kind of like doing my thing, whatever. And Henry's like, okay, well, should I call your parents? And Richard's like, nah, don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. So Henry is kind of like, okay, I'm understanding what's going here. He's very perceptive and he's like, you basically didn't want to go see your parents. So Richard is in the hospital for days. Turns out he has like pneumonia. He cut and busted his head. And if basically Henry wouldn't have found him, he would have not made it. Richard is laying in the bed and a nurse actually says that. And Henry is very visibly upset by that. Uh, Richard thanks him for saving his life and Henry just like doesn't acknowledge it and just goes back to his book. But Richard says that although Henry was kind of weird and standoffish and cold, he stayed with him almost every single day, every single hour. And one time when a nurse was too late on Richard's medicine, a nurse that had been particularly like grouchy and like not that nice, Henry stepped in the hallway and gave her an eloquent reprimand. So much so that the next time she came in to do his IV, she actually gave, called him a nickname and asked him if he was okay. So he gave her a good lashing. That's the thing with Henry. He's not very outwardly expressive, but he does show up for his friends in these moments where they need him the most. So instead of talking about how Henry basically saved his life, Richard is just like, tell me about your trip to Rome. And Henry does. And he starts to talk about the piazza they stayed at and how it was beautiful and all the things that they saw and Bunny and all of this stuff. Richard is finally good to come home and he's like, okay, you can just drop me off at the motel. And Henry looks at him like, are you dumb? Like, I'm not taking you to a motel when you still have pneumonia, have a gash on your head, and you were just in the hospital for four days. You're going to my apartment. Richard is like, geek. He's like, oh my god. I don't even think at this point Richard has been in Henry's apartment. He might have. I might not remember. He takes him home and he gets into Henry's apartment and it's basically bare. Like, it's big, it's nice, but there's nothing really in it. But the first thing he notices is a picture of Julian whispering something into Vivian Lee's ear. And he asks Henry, like, what the hell? What is that? And he starts to ask him about Julian's past. And Henry tells Richard that he has seen pictures of Julian with people like the Sitwells, T.S. Eliot, and basically someone who may or may not be Marilyn Monroe because Henry doesn't know who Marilyn Monroe is, but he basically describes Marilyn Monroe. So Richard is like, whoa, what the hell? And Henry is kind of like, vague about this but he's just like yeah Julian isn't that one like he's he's really him <clears throat> after he does his little fawning over Julian he's like hey you can sleep here take my room you know go ahead why don't you take my room I have to sleep on the bed in the back rooms anyways and it's a pull-out bed I've never gotten to sleep on a pull-out bed before so you take my bed and I'll sleep in this little janky pull-out bed and you be nice and comfortable and this is the part where you start to see Henry becoming a good friend but also you get the vibe that he's buttering Richard up He's as nice and as friendly as he has been. The first thing he did when he came back was look for Richard. Again, no one else is here, but Henry is very fine. He's okay with solitude. He's proven this before. But this is when Henry starts to see, take interest and see value in Richard. So remember that, because it's getting important. So Richard is staying with Henry, and Henry's basically an easy person to stay with. He just does his translations and his reading and his work, and they chit-chat here and there, and they have dinner. And one night, Richard is like, hey, you know, like, what happened with Bunny? Like, did he come back with you? Or like, is he still in Rome? And he's like, yeah, I, I think so. I think so. I gave him $2,000. And I was like, I gotta go. He's like, you gave him two bands? What? And he's like, yeah, despite what you think about Bunny and the Corcorans, and despite what he has said, they ain't got a dime to their name. They're actually in debt to their eyeballs. So much so, they, Henry doesn't even understand how they are maintaining appearances. Says that basically um, Bunny's entire life, even if his family once had money, blown up by living be way beyond their means. And he sends them to these schools, but they're really schools that help people who have like um, delayed learning and stuff like that. He talks about how they would send them to the most prestigious schools and boarding schools and wouldn't give them any money. And that they have always bought in Bunny's books and they've always basically taken care of him. And Henry is like, yeah, Bunny is not a scholar and he is not going to do anything with his degree if he even finishes. Basically says that Mr. and Mrs. Corcoran made a mistake sending Bunny to college because he has, and I quote, no gift for scholarship. <laughs> Henry does not think much of Bunny's wit, but you get the sense that he loves him in the way that one loves a dog. 
if that makes sense. He talks about Bunny like he's just like a pet that he has to like take care of. This piece can't last. One day Richard wakes up and he hears boom, 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 banging on the door. And he's like, what the fuck? Is it the police? But no, it is just Mr. Edmund Corcoran, Bunny himself, back from Rome. Bunny's like a little jealous. He's like, why are you here? And Richard's like, oh, I've just been staying with Henry. Like he came back early and you know, I, he just offered me to stay because he was lonely. So I was like, sure. And Bunny is like, okay, like he's not vibing with it. But he just barges his way into the apartment. And he's like, let's have some coffee. Like, do you have espresso? Like I had espresso in Rome. Like I'm cultured, I'm a Roman now. They start talking about the trip. And before long, Henry comes back, sees Bunny is there and he's like, oh, Richard. Hey, remember how I had to have you drive me into town? I need you to drive me to an eye appointment. And Richard's like, huh? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're gonna dilate my eyes. I'm gonna get some new glasses. Will you take me into town? And Richard's like, yeah. And Bunny is like, hmm, okay. And we come back and Henry's like, I don't know, Bun, but it's not gonna take that long. Like, I'm just getting my eyes done. And Richard's like, all right, let's go. And before they can go, he's like, I need to talk to you when you come back. And Henry's like, yes, okay, bunny, come back this evening, I gotta go. And Richard go to the eye appointment, and Richard's driving, and he gets to the edge of town, and he's like, all right, where do I go? And Henry just laughs, and he's like, keep driving, because he doesn't have an eye appointment. He just did not want to hang out with bunny. <laughs> so that night, Richard and Henry go back, and they wake up, and boom, 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 once again, they hear loud, loud knocking on the door. Henry comes out carrying a kerosene lamp. <laughs> because that's what he, that's what Henry does. Once again, it is Bunny and Henry just kind of puts his finger to his mouth and he's like, shh. And they both stand there and watch as Bunny bangs, bangs, bangs. And then finally he leaves and they just go to bed. The next day there's knocking, but it's much less aggressive. And Richard and Henry assume it's not Bunny. They peek, they see that it's boom, Francis, and they let him in. So Francis comes in and he is not in a good mood. Him and Henry go in the back and talk. Richard's kind of like eavesdropping, but he can't really make anything out except for that Francis is not happy. And he's just talking about the state of mind that a person would be in. And they have this really, really hushed, hushed conversation. And Francis comes out and he's like, I gotta go. Bye Richard, like it was nice to see you. I, I, I am super busy. And Richard's like, okay, this is really weird. And he's starting to feel like a little left out. So then Henry's like, hey, could you call Bunny and tell him to come over a little bit later? You can actually take my car if you need it. And he's basically heavily implying like, you need to leave. <laughs> thank you, you need to leave because I need Bunny to come over. And at this point, Richard is like, kind of like icked out. He's like, listen, I want to leave. I'm gonna go back to my dorm. I'm gonna go back to my little friends. I'm gonna do what I need to do. And he dips that and he's like, I didn't even call Bunny until I got back to campus from Henry's apartment because I wanted to be far away from that. My name Bunny, I ain't in it. Chapter four, Richard is like, okay, we're going back to school. Everything's gonna be fine. And he has only heard from Henry and Bunny. So he is like, pissed off. Why would the twins come back and not call him? Why has Francis been ignoring him? And why have Henry and Bunny been weird and also kind of ignoring him? He goes to visit Julian and he's thinking Julian's gonna have answers and Julian's like, I haven't seen anybody but Bunny. I don't know what to tell you. He, and Julian's kind of questioning Richard, like, what's going on? What are you doing? And Julian's kind of feeling like he's being left out. Now, when Richard realizes that Julian has no idea what's going on, he has no idea what's going on. The hairs on his back are starting to stand up. And that kind of like rejection, like I'm not allowed to sit with the cool kids anymore feeling is kind of the prickle on the back of his neck. Cause remember, he thought he successfully had worked his way into the inner circle. He was one of them and he would be included in everything. And now he's realizing that some things not even Julian are privy to. So that means there might be a layer that he still needs to penetrate within the inner circle. Richard's really annoyed that none of them tried to call him and find him immediately when they came back to campus like Henry did, because he's such an egotistical brat. So he goes to see Bunny and he realizes Bunny's room is kind of messy, but Bunny is not there and he can't find him. He goes to call Francis in the country house and he lets it ring and ring and ring and ring like 30 something times to the where it's like, okay, I'm not gonna hang up until you answer. And it, Francis answers, but he uses a fake voice and Richard can kind of hear people in the background. So he's like, okay, they all went to the country house and none of them invited me. So what is going on? What is going on? He's worried that he's being pushed out of the inner circle. So Richard is just in a pissy little mood because he feels left out and he just spends some hours reading. But after he's reading, he's kind of hungry, goes to the commons. Who does he see? And Bunny Corcoran. They're drunk and watching TV. Bunny, Richard is like, do you know where everyone is? And Bunny's like, no, I actually don't know. I was wondering if you knew where everyone is. And Richard's like, I don't know anything. I think they're in the country house, but what I really want to know is what happened between you and Henry in Rome. And Bunny's like, well, Henry's not who you think he is. And Richard's like, what? <laughs> 
And for a minute, he thinks that maybe Henry had tried to like make a pass at Bunny. He tried to hook up with them. But he says, nah, he dismisses that because he does not think that Henry is gay. Anyways, this acts like bisexuality doesn't exist this entire novel. <laughs> it's, it's funny though, because Richard is like, Henry's not gay, but even if he was, he wouldn't pick Bunny. And then you get the sense that he finished it with it, but he would pick me in his head. <laughs> Richard has still not heard from them and he's just like whatever he wakes up early the next day to finish his Greek work before class and he realizes damn it I left my book in Henry's apartment he has a key though so he's like Henry's been avoiding me I have a key to his apartment I need this book to finish my homework what do I do so it's early 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 in the morning and he's like I'm just gonna go to Henry's get my damn book and if he has an issue then we'll just we'll just have it out okay as he makes his way he realizes nobody is home he's super happy he goes to grab his book and he's about ready to leave on the way out of Henry's apartment he spots a little piece of paper and he's like what is this and he realizes it's airplane tickets and a telephone number so Richard being Richard picks up the phone calls the number pretending to be Henry and in doing so he learns that Henry has not only booked a flight for himself to Argentina for the next day but also for Charles Camilla and Francis one way to Argentina leaving tomorrow. Richard is more like confused and pissed off and hurt than ever so he just is like whatever I'm gonna go. It's Thursday so he doesn't have class with Julian or any of the Greek students until Monday so he's like I'm just gonna go to class I'm gonna do my thing all weekend nobody calls nobody talks to him so much so that he calls Mrs. Abernathy Francis's mother in Boston and tries to figure out where Francis is and Francis's mother is really alarmed because she's like is he not at school and Richard realizes okay whatever is going on they did not even tell their parents and one thing to know about Mrs. Abernathy is she is a clinger okay she's a clinger the fact that Richard is like Francis's mom doesn't even know he makes up an excuse says oh I see him coming across the lawn and he hangs up because now he's like some sketch is coming on after that walking doing his thing and he runs into bunny who asked richard if he's seen anyone and richard's like i was gonna ask you the same thing because i haven't they have more of a conversation about italy but bunny is being very hush hush about what happened between him and henry richard is like is it money related like you know trying to be nosy and stir the pot and responds that henry i love him and you love him he's just got a little bit of jewish blood Richard is thrown off by this because it's one thing for bunny to make bigoted comments again every time he <laughs> attacks a new minority group Richard is like whoa okay and Bunny says Henry is worried that people like him and love him for his money and that's just not the case with me but he doesn't go into further detail Richard says it's very bizarre that Henry would think that and that Bunny would say that considering they're just friends but he just lets it roll off his back and he spends the entire weekend just like thinking about them what are they doing basically obsessing but telling the reader that he's not obsessing and then Monday rolls around and he just cannot wait back to get back to what I see and he is like I need to know where y'all have been and what y'all have been doing he goes in him and Julian are super skeptical and everyone's just acting normal <laughs> they're just acting normal and they give the most terrible stupid excuses and neither Julian nor Richard is buying it and they're all like oh uh, we were in the countryside but there was a car accident and there was no service and Richard is like whatever he doesn't believe it so after that he just goes back to his room he's like I'm not doing this with you guys and he's just laying there contemplating how he hates his life how he went from being popular and all his friends are leaving him and he hears a knock on his door who is it but Mr. Henry Winter and Henry says will you come for a drive with me and Richard's like yeah finally <laughs> let me get my brace so Henry takes Richard on the drive and they drive way out of the way to this estate sale and Richard is like okay like whatever I'll go to the estate sale with you like these guys being dudes and then afterwards Henry's like let's go get some food and Richard's like okay yes I can always eat they're sitting there and they're eating and Richard is enjoying his food and Henry just looks up and he goes do you want to know about our trip to Argentina and Richard is like oh he's gagged and he's like actually yeah I'm surprised that you knew about that and Henry's like well when you purchase an airline ticket the day before and then call a couple hours later to confirm the ticket you just purchased they're probably gonna be annoyed when you call a third time the next day to confirm the ticket you purchased yesterday that you already confirmed I called to cancel the ticket so they were even more mad that I had confirmed than canceled but after we figured it all out everything was fine and before Richard can like really badger him and ask what's going on Henry's like let's go to Francis's apartment and Richard is like, 
okay all right to Francis's we go when they arrive to Francis place he's not home but Henry tells Richard that he is out at a movie with Bunny and Richard is like okay then why did we come to Francis's house if you knew he was at a movie with Bunny like what is going on Henry is talking about Argentina and he's like well, the reason that we didn't go is because of money issues. And Richard is like, what are you talking about? Not only is everybody in this group wealthy, Henry and Francis specifically are exponentially wealthy. He explains that he lives off a monthly allowance and it's been more than enough and he's put most of it away. But the trip with Bunny kind of cleared him out and Richard is like shocked by this because Henry is missing money bags. He says Francis lives off a trust, which is not as liquid as Henry's money, but you can take like the principal amount or something. I don't know. You can take a lot of money K out of it, something along those lines. So Richard is like, what did y'all need all this money for? Why were y'all going on a one-way flight to Argentina? And why did y'all cancel it? Why weren't y'all able to get the money? And he is like, well, Mrs. Abernathy already took the money out. And like I said, Bunny ran my pockets dry. So Henry's like, we ultimately canceled it because we couldn't move to Argentina, which is that little money between all of us. And this whole time, Richard's like, why are we moving to Argentina? Like, what is Argentina? And Henry just gives him a look and Richard's head is like reeling and you can see him kind of putting the dots together. And he just looks at Henry and he goes, my God, Henry, what did you do? Henry just kind of gives him a blank stare and Richard goes, oh my God, you killed someone, didn't you? And instead of really being like, no, how dare you accuse me of such a thing? Henry's like, I knew you figured it out. I knew you were smart. All the others didn't think you would, but I believed in you. And you just missed that. There is something very wrong with the dynamic here. So Henry starts to explain that all of the students, with the exclusion of Bunny, participated in a Dionysic ritual called a Bacchanalia, a Bacchae, a Bacchanal, whatever you want to call it. And it is basically a cultic, um, sexual rituals to summon the god, to praise the god Dionysus, who is the god of wine and partying and so much and so forth. Henry starts to talk about how Julian lectured about Dionysic madness last semester and how it took over and losing yourself into the primal and remember that whole spiel earlier about intellects having to lose intellectualism and go back to the primal form or whatever whatever well they took it to heart so <clears throat> henry starts talking about how they made it their goal to have a dionysic madness experience like they had ancient greek and henry's like to my knowledge it hadn't been done for a thousand of years and richard's like yeah because this is crazy talk about too much what happens in bacchae and bacchanalia but you can definitely google it if you want YouTube will definitely not allow me to show you any of it, but fair warning, it is gruesome, it is bloody, and it is erotic. But anyways, back to the book. Henry talks about all the ways that they try to induce this Dionysian madness. He talks about them, um, you know, drinking these weird potions, chewing leaves, and doing things that rhyme with rugs, and prayer, microdosing poison, fasting, basically everything but being a child of God they did to induce Dionysian magic. And Richard is like, when was this happening? And Henry's like, every weekend. Like, we would sneak out during the night at the country house and we would try to do it. He's like, you almost caught us so many times. Random injuries. Remember the strange tinctures you saw him brewing? The, the sheets that are always going missing? The conversations? Everything's coming back to Richard's mind. And he's like, oh my god, I am a village idiot because they have been doing this right underneath my nose. Why didn't you invite me? That's all you hear about really all he cares about. He is so sick at the fact that he was not included. And Henry's like, you are basically a stranger. Like we tried to warm up to you, but you didn't let us in, kid. You're a little too mysterious for our liking. And Richard's like, God damn it. So he talks about their initial rituals that were trying to induce madness and how they all failed because their belief wasn't genuine and how all of the members from then on took it super seriously, except for, you guessed it, Bunny. <laughs> Henry goes on to talk about how they had fasted for three days and he was like we are about on the cusp of this I know we're gonna do this and they just thought that Bunny would make a joke or he would ruin it or something because he had done so many times before Henry tells Richard that Charles saw Bunny <laughs> in the cafeteria eating a grilled cheese and a glass of milk or a milkshake and Henry was like yep that's it you're cut you're not on the team you're not on the pyramid you are no longer with the Avalie Dance Company and after that with Bunny excluded, they tried one more time and they were able to do it. He tells Richard that the experience was marvelous. He says that they saw the god Dionysus in its corporal form and Richard is like, okay, buddy. And Henry actually gets like irritated that Richard's like not taking it serious. He's like, have you ever saw Dionysus? And Richard's like, 
you're right, you're right, keep going. So he basically talks about how they were running for hours and time was going crazy and there was a deer and there was everything and all this crazy stuff. And Richard is like, aren't these like, you know, sexual rituals? It's like, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. And Richard's like, no, 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 no. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Cause the ratio, brother, sister, gay, you. What was going on here? And Henry's like, don't worry about it. He refuses to go into detail. So Richard's like, okay. Henry's like, I forgot so much of that night. I know we ran for miles. I know we did whatever. All that I know is when I came to the countryside, I was covered in blood. The farmer, unalive, laying at the end of my feet. And that each member of the Bacchanal was slightly different slightly different variations of injuries covered in blood he said that charles had a bite on him that could not have come from a human when they found camilla she had her feet in the frozen water and everything was white on her except for her hair which was caked with blood to the point where it looked like she had tried to dye it francis was just like out of his mind after the bacchanal camilla was so traumatized that she couldn't speak and she when she started to speak her elementary french came back first a lot of allegories and a lot of things that are written in between the lines here and a lot of people have made up their own theories i'll put them in the comments below so youtube won't flag what i think happened but look up the camilla the killing of the sacred deer theory because i personally think miss milla was a victim in this entire situation however we don't know henry is like when we came to and we saw that guy looking like a chopped cheese on the ground we did the dash and richard is like what like do you even feel bad and henry's like oh yeah i feel bad like yeah but like it wasn't me like it was dionysus like I, I didn't do it i wouldn't really feel that bad about it if it wasn't for bunny and richard's like bunny wasn't there bunny doesn't know why are you so pissed at him and before henry can start francis comes back then that takes us to chapter five so francis hooks in top of chapter five he is immediately concern when he sees these two he immediately knows what's going on so much so that he looks at henry and he's like you did it and henry's like he already figured it out <laughs> and when he says that richard is like listen i already knew it doesn't matter he didn't tell me and richard then again is like why didn't you go to the police now that francis is not on alert and he's like whatever and henry's like imagine paint the picture for you okay a whole bunch of freaky deaky rich kids that dress up like their 18th century vampires are in the countryside in upstate Vermont to sing cult rituals and accidentally kill a local. They'll go down like a house on fire. They will literally give us the chair. And Richard's like, yeah, I can see it now. Like rich kids, cult, the college could even get shut down. They all are like telling this wild tale. And you know, there is some truth to be said to what they're saying. Does that make it right? That's for Thomas Hart to decide. Henry also lets us know that the crime that was committed was not committed at the farmhouse but was committed on the farmer's land so when richard hears that he's like oh yeah y'all would have been cooked y'all would have been toast and henry's like and by the way if we would have went right to the police and turned ourselves in we would have literally been shot on sight because we were wearing bloody chitons bloody robes we had blood everywhere we looked absolutely crazy and crazy but we were on drugs we it would have ended terribly bad and he's like we were all out of our minds tells him about camilla richard's like okay okay i get it i get it i get it but richard is like bunny wasn't there okay why do y'all care about bunny like i'm i'm failing to see the problem and he's like yeah bunny wasn't there he was actually at the movies with you that night and richard's like oh wait he was richard's like hmm okay did y'all plan that he's like giving these little notes in his head but he digresses and um henry is like yeah everything would have been fine everything would have been great y'all have fun and then Bunny told you he was gonna go back to his room and have a drink, but he didn't. He went back to my apartment and wanted to scare me, but fell asleep on the couch. And they were roommates. Anyways, Bunny had to fell asleep, and when the others came back, they bursted in Henry's apartment, of course, stressed and freaked out of their mind. Bunny wakes up, screaming his head off, because they're all covered in blood, looking crazy. Finally calm him down, and they're like, Bunny, it's fine. We hit a deer on the way home from the country house, and that's why there's everything everywhere. We tried to save it, we tried to whatever, and Bunny's like, oh, okay. He doesn't really buy it, but at the point he's so sleepy, he just tends to go to bed, and he's like, okay. And Henry's like, thank God, let's get this cleaned up, and let's get rid of this evidence. Richard is like, okay, so what's the problem? And Henry's like... Well, Bunny's a lot smarter than we ever gave him credit for because after he comes to you the next morning, he starts to slowly poke holes 
in our story he talks about again that large bite that i said charles had on his arm that no human could have made he also talks about henry's car being perfect they go outside and they say henry isn't this the you know the car you hit the deer with and they're like yeah and he's like wow it's it's not a spot on it and they're like okay he's catching on because bunny is really upset about the idea of being left out remember he really wants to be in this inner circle just as much as richard does richard is like okay so why would bunny care if y'all did the bacchanal with him and henry's like bunny won't care that we unalive alive someone bunny's just gonna care that we did it without him like i don't think he will tell marion and i don't think he will tell julian but even if he does julian knew we were having bacchanals anyway so whatever and richard is like excuse me and he's like yeah julian knew hello he was the one helping us and telling us what to do but he says they cleaned up everything they managed to get away without anything being unscathed and being unnoticed they're just living their life henry's telling richard you know i thought we got away with it everything was fine until bunny saw an article about the farmer in the dell that went to heaven hopefully not hell and he begins joking that maybe they're responsible for it and henry starts to worry that bunny's jokes may be overheard by other people aka marion or some teacher and they will call the police and start an investigation and henry does not want that henry is like i'm too pretty i'm too smart i will never go to jail i need to keep bunny on their good side <laughs> and Henry let Richard in on the fact that they have been funding Bunny's lifestyle this entire freaking rest of the semester. That is why Bunny and Henry went to Rome. Henry tells Richard that almost every year Bunny hints overly so that they should go on a trip together and normally Henry never never indulges it but this year he decided why not hopefully they'll do this and Bunny won't be such an asshole and he takes him to Rome and it's a luxury trip okay spares no expense but unfortunately bunny doesn't care it makes things worse okay when they get there bunny complains about the accommodations he claims about how much money he's given despite the opulence despite everything that henry has done this beautiful piazza and it's a place where like this countess or like something used to live and it's great and bunny's like it's basically a motel six and he talks about the fact that bunny would not stop making jokes and telling stories about the farmer and one time they're in the piazza and they're having lunch and bunny is just jabber jaying away and henry notices some german tourist guy is like hanging on to every word henry's like we need to get the out of here and go back to the place that we're staying they leave and the entire time henry is noticing the german man is following them so they ditch them they go through some alley and then henry goes up to his room and from the vantage point of his window he can see that the german man is kind of lurking and waiting to see what they went into and he waits out there for like a couple hours and he keeps telling bunny and bunny thinks this is like the most funny thing he's like maybe he's a cia agent maybe he's a spy that like he wants to go out and like find him and talk to him and henry's like are you okay like are you done and okay the next day henry's like okay this guy's fine whatever i don't see him but out doing touristy stuff and he sees him again and they go in the piazza he knows the german guy knows what hotel they stay at so henry's like uh-uh we move in hotels we move hotels to a beautiful one bunny's like this is literally like camping this is this is disgusting we need to go stay at this really expensive place and henry's like i'm not staying at this five thousand dollar a night place you're absolutely crazy they're fighting so much that henry gets a migraine Lillian had talked about this earlier that henry is prone to a sickness and that sickness is intense migraines okay incapacity for days if you've ever had a migraine or know someone who is prone to them it is not a headache it is way different than a headache and they are absolutely debilitating so this migraine puts henry down for the count incapacitates him for a few days and he is in italy he can't talk he can't speak he can't go to the hospital and be like hey can you give me some shot of phenobarbital because that's what they took at the time which is crazy and also he's an american he doesn't he, he barely speaks italian good enough to get by but doesn't think he could translate enough so he was like i need to wire my doctor in the states and it was just a whole big thing it was of course useless like useless i couldn't even get ice water all i had was lukewarm water the entire time and i was in and out of consciousness and i don't know where bunny is <sighs> well henry is telling him all this and richard is like wow this is not the bunny i knew like bunny's annoying but i never thought he was this annoying and henry's like well so henry comes out of his you know little fog and he's finally able to sit up and open his eyes and he's looking around and he can't see bunny and he kind of turns his head and pivots and he sees bunny hovering over this desk with all these papers and 
Henry's journal and he is livid. Buddy gets up and starts screaming. He tells Richard that he writes his journal in Latin so that nobody can read it, especially Bunny, because Bunny cannot read Latin and Bunny has no boundaries. But because Henry was incapacitated for so many days, Bunny had a decent amount of time to translate. And in his journal, Henry was not very nice to Bunny or about him. So much so he would call him Canuculus molestus, which roughly translates to annoying rabbit. More importantly though, Henry had written in detail in Latin about the murder, confirming Bunny's suspicions and jokes that they had indeed murdered the farmer. And Bunny is causing a scene. He is causing a ruckus. He is screaming. The chambermaids and the maids from the piazzas are coming up and Henry is like, shut the hell up. He grabs his journal, throws it into the fire, and without even thinking, he slaps Bunny across the face and Bunny goes dead silent. And Henry at this point is like, I slapped him, which was the wrong thing to do, but I was so annoyed that Bunny was not even mad at the crime because of the moral outrage, but rather upset because he was excluded from it. And then he said in order to get him on his back, back on his good side because he slapped him and he shouldn't have done that, he is spending money on him. Money, 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 but Bunny is just insufferable. He's just needling and he's ordering the most expensive thing everywhere and he's having unlimited shopping sprees all while making um, jokes about the farmer and all while commenting on how their murderer are gonna go to jail. And Henry just cannot take it. So in the middle of the night, he has to leave. He books a flight home, leaves Bunny two Gs and says, listen, I got to go. And Richard is shocked at this. Again, he's just baffled at the $2,000 left in the bed. If I left some rest in the bed, you could keep it. And Henry is like, that is an infinitesimal sum to what I have spent on this man, okay? It's a small, small fraction of what this Italy trip cost me. She just like, excuse me? And then he's like, yeah, not only has Bunny been blackmailing me, he's been blackmailing everybody. Even the twins who are not, like they're relatively poor if you compare them to Francis and Henry. And when Richard hears this, he's like, not my twin, not my baby. Excuse me? Francis basically says he spent hundreds of dollars on dinners, calls Bunny a pig, it's super funny. They talk about how they didn't really mind taking care of Bunny when they first became friends with him. It would always be books or new clothes or even dinners here and there, but they said now he just uses them as a personal ATM. So to the point Francis' mom thinks he is using drugs because he has spending so much money. And Henry's like, I don't think my parents will ever cut me off, but if they do, they will cut me off for good. Like they ain't the type to play with and I'm kind of scared. So Richard is like, what the hell? And they're like, I'll tell Bunny that you know, because if you tell him that you know about this and we told you, he's going to try to implicate you because he's going to be so jealous and he's going to be so excluded. And Richard is like, what? And Henry is basically like, yeah, like Bunny hates you. Like he's jealous of you. Like you came to our group. You speak super good Greek. You got in. You fit in with all of us even better. Like you're a better scholar than him. You're a better Greek student than him. Julian loves you. From, you're from California. You're a rare bird. And Richard's like, what? What? Really? Like you're kidding, right? And Henry's kind of just like continuing to butter him up. So Richard is basically like, okay, so what are we gonna do? Cause y'all are gonna go to jail cause Bunny cannot shut up. And Henry's kind of like, don't worry about it. Not a plan, it just depends on how far we're willing to go. Richard's like, we? In Richard's eyes, he's in the inner, inner circle now. He's the one thing that they've been hiding from him. And now he is like, not only do I know the secret, but I'm kind of replacing Bunny. Like I'm in here like swimwear. So he, he's, he's like disturbed. But he's okay. He spends the night at Francis's apartment. The next morning he thinks, he wakes up, he thinks about everything and he leaves. Richard says, in retrospect, if he ever had a moment of doing what was right or going to the police or whatever, the moment that he left Francis's apartment is the one moment he contemplated doing the right thing and he decides against it and says that that one decision profoundly changed the course of his entire life. Now we're in the point of Richard, he's been at Hamden, he got into the Greeks class, everything's amazing, he has these friends, they're going to the country house, they're rich, everything's cool, his teacher's mysterious. And now, these new friends that he has are looking a lot like a cult and looking like we're gonna have to do something about Bunny. Everything Richard kind of idealized is coming more into focus in 4K. He even says that in the beginning, you know, his memories were murky of them, but the weekend of the country house is when he starts to see them for who they really are. And this right here really exposes him to all of the people that he's actually been friends with, including we will see in the future, Julian. When he goes back to his room, he literally just starts working on his Greek homework 
and he talks about studying Greek and he says that one of the benefits or the many benefits is certain common ideas become unexpressible while other previously undreamt of ones spring to life finding miraculous new articulation. The sense that Greek helps Richard speak in a way that he couldn't and helps him speak his true mind and many in the way that um, Socrates was to Plato. And he says because of this and because of the way this language and this culture allows you to express yourself, he feels a deep connection to these people because they are the only ones who understand it. After he finishes, he goes to Bunny's room and Bunny tells him that he and Henry, <laughs> Bunny and Henry, are planning a really lengthy, beautiful, expensive trip to France for the coming summer. And Bunny's like, why don't you come along, old man? Why don't you just string along? Henry will pay, he don't care. And Richard is like, oh, okay. And he turns to look at Charles and Camilla, who are also present. And whenever Charles gets the chance, he takes Richard aside and he's like, listen, Henry told me that you know what happened. And when Richard is like, yeah, I do. Like, I know what you did, but I still love you. And what are you going to do? And Charles is like, he literally shrugs and just walks away. And Richard and Charles are like, they're getting really close and Bunny's just like, you know, rambling, rambling on about this trip to France. Richard and Charles leave, they head to class, and they tell Henry that Bunny is planning a trip to France for them. <laughs> and Henry's like, spare me the details until class is over, like, I need my full brain and I don't want to spend this entire session thinking about going to France with Bunny and getting disowned by my parents and being fabulous. After this little exchange, Bunny and Camilla come to class and Bunny is just being disgusting, making misogynistic comments about Camilla and saying how she's not on the same caliber as them and how the Greeks didn't view women as the same, yada yada yada, and everyone's just ignoring him. He's all together being just like a dick. And Richard is like, okay, this beautiful facade of everybody loving each other and getting along is starting to crack and I just don't like this. So he goes back to his room, he takes a sleeping pill, and who comes to wake him up but Miss Camilla. And Camilla is like, do you wanna go for a ride? And Richard's like, yes, of course. And notice how it's always Camilla that's going to pick Richard and Bunny up. Just saying. Richard goes with Camilla and to his surprise he sees Henry and Francis and they all go for a drive and it's really fun. And he notices that they're all having fun and the exception is that Bunny isn't here. And later they're driving and Henry sees this property that's like 150 acres and he loves it and he's like I want to buy that because we could all live there without any sign of civilization and just all be together and Richard's like that's amazing and I'm like that's a cult <laughs> and he is just in knee deep driving and they're just looking through Vermont and they're having a good time and they end up at this cheap restaurant where Bunny would never come looking for them and it's a cheap little country place where the portions are big and the prices are small and everything goes by largely unscathed but out of the corner of his eye Richard notices Henry talking to a small boy who is well he's not small he's like a server and he's asking Henry about the way they dress and Greek and all of this stuff and Henry tells him they're right from on the other side of town. Richard kind of notes that though Henry is a very elitist kind of like pretentious twat he's really good with what Richard decides country people despite his background and appearance and that regular folk seem to like him take that for what you will I'm just gonna pretend it's that good old Midwestern charm because he's from Missouri but it also speaks a lot to how Richard reveres people with money and kind of this kiss the ring uh, personality that Henry has. Does Henry even really have that or is he just talking to this boy who Henry knows is smart but just because he doesn't come from money doesn't mean he's not smart. Richard has this, you never know really, Richard's a big old liar. He's like Amy Dunn and unreliable. Time is going by and they're just you know living their life and Richard is kind of like dang I'm not really bothered by this farmer thing like maybe that's a problem like maybe that's something I should be bothered by. He's like shocked that he's not really bothered by it and instead he really starts to be irritated with Bunny and all of these little quirks and quip bigotry you know if you will that Bunny used to spew out are really starting to grate on him. He starts to see him through a different lens and he talks about one night in the country house they're all up there and he's awoken hearing Bunny yelling at Henry and he is basically just rattling off expletives homophobic slurs, anti-semitic slurs, but he also calls him uh, a World War II soldier, if you know what I mean. Richard was like kind of confused because Bunny was just pulling whatever he had out the bag. And after that, Henry comes and he knocks on the door of Richard where he's sleeping and says the fight was, was yes related to the farmer. And he says, will you go to the room where Bunny is sleeping and grab me some aspirin? I'm getting a headache. And Richard is like, I don't want to go see Bunny. And Henry is like, dude, please 
And we're just like, fine. So he goes in there, finds the room is completely trash. Bunny's like sleeping, crying, and he just gets the aspirin and he leaves. And the next day at breakfast, they're all in the country house still, and Bunny is just moody but silent, which is wild because Bunny is never silent. Richard knows that Bunny's behavior is just getting worse and worse and worse. He's even snapping at Marion, who he loves and never does. And he also is snapping with this little man up here who finally comes into play, Cloak Rayborn, who is one of Bunny's friends from high school, who now attends Hamden College. Bunny, okay, makes it his mission single-handedly to attack each and every member of the group, especially where their weaknesses are, right? Charles, it's his drinking, right? He comments about how much he drinks, which Richard notes Charles does drink a decent amount, always has, but it has increased since the whole farmer in the Dell. And he leaves like AA pamphlets around and he talks about cirrhosis of the liver, just grates under his skin. Francis for his, for being gay, so anything under the sun you can think of talking about AIDS, talking about him making passes at everybody. Richard recalls a time where Francis made a pass at him and Richard was like, I was like kind of nervous around Francis, but he made a pass at me, I knew he was going to. But when I declined him, he was really nice and our friendship didn't change, so it was great. And I'm just like, oh my God. Okay, Richard. It also, speaking of Richard, Bunny gets on Richard for his relative poverty and he will do things like say, oh, Richard, I love your belt, like is it Hermes? And Richard will just be like, yeah, not knowing what brand that is. And Bunny will reach across the table and pull the tag out to show that it's not. Or he will ask if his mom wears polyester suits. And it's really sad, Richard talks about this point where he has one picture of his mom that he hid in a book, but he's so scared that Bunny will find it and make fun of her that he throws it in the fire. I don't know if Richard is just pathetic or a loser if that's sad or, it's. I think it's a mix of both. I think it's a mix of both. And of course, he gets on Miss Milla for being what a woman because that's all he has and one night these three are at the twins apartment and bunny is drinking whiskey and he's being particularly nasty and this is the first time that we get an insinuation of the big eye between the twins and he basically accuses them of having a relationship that is not just familial. Although Camilla usually doesn't bat an eye, um, Richard tells us that Bunny can attack her looks, she doesn't care, attack her intelligence, she knows she's smarter than him, she has more money than him, she's very, basically impenetrable. But Richard notes that this is the one thing that bothers her and she gets up and leaves the room. She's like, just because I wouldn't get with you, you think I get with my brother? And Bunny's like, I wouldn't get with you if you were the last woman on earth. And Richard is like, <laughs> can't relate, but also interesting because Bunny is a rat. While everyone's kind of just like taking a battering and a bashing, Bunny's not really saying anything to Henry because he's kind of like milking him like for all his money. But Henry, okay, watching his friends getting systematically destroyed by Bunny is plotting, preying on his downfall. But Richard and all of them don't know really what he has his mind to or what he's doing. And one day, Judy Poovey's like, hey, you want to like do a whole bunch of like the opposite of Pepsi together? And Richard's like, what? And he's, she's like, yeah, let's hang out. So they go to Burger King and they do a whole bunch of Pepsi in the Burger King. And as they're driving, she's like, isn't that Henry? And Richard's like, no, because it's, he's at a head shop talking to a hippie. And Richard's like, why would Henry be at a head shop? A smoke shop is not Henry. And Judy's like, that's Henry. And he's like, no, it's not. Because they're all like ramped up. And she's just like, whoa okay i think the pepsi's getting to us let's go just like ducks as she drives by and they go so he's like what is henry up to fret not mister because a couple days later boom 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 who's at richard's door henry <laughs> and richard's like hey what's up and henry's like hey i got a question can i come in richard's like yeah 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 do your thing so henry comes in and he says hey hypothetically because you studied pre-med you should be able to help me with this and richard's like um I may have, yeah, studied pre-med. Yeah, I did say that, didn't I? And he's like, I kind of stretched the truth there. I was only pre-med for like a year and a half. So I don't really know if I can help you. But he also talks about how the classic students are like so far removed from reality. The fact that Richard studied pre-med basically turned him into a doctor in his eyes. And they're always coming to him and being like, should I get antibiotics for this? What should I do about this? And Richard's like, I don't know. But they just don't want to hear it. So Richard is like, what can I help you with? He basically goes, here's the gag. I want to unalive Bunny 
with some poisonous mushrooms. But to make it look like I didn't do it on purpose, we're both going to eat the mushrooms, but I want to give Bunny enough doses that he dies and I don't want to die. So I need you, the pre-med student that you are, to work out the formula. So I will eat just enough to be sick as fuck but not die. And Richard is like, what are you talking about? And he's like, I can't do this. And Richard is like, okay, yeah, I'm impressed by the plan. If anything could be relied upon, it's going to be the fact that Bunny will give anything that you eat and place in front of him. But I don't know how to do this. I don't know what you guys weigh. I don't know the grams of the mushrooms. And he's basically like, this is my one chance I have to kind of dissuade Henry from this, okay? He goes and he kind of like fiddles and fakes it. And he's like, listen, Henry, I can't even work this out. I don't even think a professor could work this out without all this missing data. There's too many variables. It's not going to work. And Henry's like, well, I read this Persian book that said it would. And then Richard's like, oh, yeah, a couple weeks ago, I saw some Arabic text in the back of your car. That's what you were reading? You were reading a thousand-year-old Arabic text? He's like, the Persians were master poisoners. And Richard's like, they're all gone for thousands of years. Even you know that medical science can't be compared to ancient science. And Henry's like, well, why do we study it then? And Richard's like, oh my god, you're so annoying. And he's like, how do you even get this? We're like, where do you even get this? And Henry's like, well, you know those two annoying dogs that really live below my apartment? And Richard's like, you did it. And he's like, let's just say one of them won't be bothering us anymore. And Richard like laughs and Henry laughs. And I'm like, this is a sign of a early morning sign of a serial schmiller. So ultimately Richard is like, listen, this is not going to work. You like, you are, you will pass away. And Henry's like, well, what if I have an antidote? And Richard's like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, like I said, the Persians, this Arabic text from the 15th century speaks of an antidote. Richard's like, Henry? we're in the modern world and he's like people use these books for centuries before modern medicine their accuracy is beyond dispute and richard is just like arguing but henry's not trying to hear it and he's just like the more i hear about luxury barges the less terrible death seems because he's thinking about that trip to france with bunny and how he is not going on it and he's like i would rather eat these mushrooms and die along with him and spend a trip to france with him so he thanks richard for his help and he leaves richard is like this is not going good this is not going good. The next day, Richard is like, hey, Charles, you know, let's meet up. Let's have a drink. Do you know about this? And Charles is like, I do. I do. I do. And I think it's really stupid. And he was like, did you contemplate doing this to Bunny? Charles is like, I'd rather go to jail hanging around the neck for the rest of my life. AK insinuating we will never get this man off of us. We will never have to stop taking care of him. Because he knows what we did last summer. So I would literally rather just end his life and go to jail for it. What? Like he would rather literally snitch than be Bunny's friend. So Rich is like, come on, damn, y'all really hate this man. And I had blinders on. After the conversation, he has a brief combo with Camilla who wonders, you know, would it have been better if they all just went to South America together? And she's just like, we should have just gone and been poor and just whatever. And Richard's like, I'm glad you didn't go. And Camilla just walks away. She does not respond. And Richard's starting to realize, okay, maybe she doesn't like me like she thought. Maybe Henry was using Camilla to get me closer to him, to get me to do what he wanted to do. So as this continues to pass, Bunny just gets more and more and more intolerable. Even Francis and Henry are like, we are running out of money to the point where we cannot eat. And one day, Julian is like, hey, Richard, come to class. And Richard is just like pondering all of this stuff. And he's like, you know, let's have a one on one lunch. And this is kind of a big deal. He said earlier, when Richard originally went to the Lyceum, he saw that Camilla was in there. And he also has seen Julian give Henry a kiss on the cheek. So Richard is like, oh my God, I'm having my like first little special one-on-one. -on -one. Like it's the bachelor with Julian. At the lunch, Julian is just kind of like questioning, like what's going on with the group? Kind of realizing just the gossip, the wink link, he will tell them. And Richard is kind of oblivious to the fact that Julian is just inviting him here to kind of pry information out of him. And he knows that Henry said Julian knows what happened at the Bacchanal, but he is not sure if Julian knows that they, you know, did what they did to the farmer. So he is like, yeah, um, that's crazy. So Richard, again, he's having lunch with Julian, but then he's like, wait a second, what are we eating? And he realizes it's mushrooms. Julian is like, yeah, Henry, the forager has been bringing me mushrooms. What a sweetie, he's been doing it for a couple months. And Richard is like, Henry is plotting planting the seeds so that when Bunny eventually eats the mushrooms that Henry quote quote found, kicks the bucket, Julian, Richard, and all of his friends will be able to say, no, Henry loved mushroom hunting. And Julian, 
who has eaten them many times. Extremely credible, extremely notable, and kind of revered, not only Hamden, but in, I guess, the world. I mean, what about a backup plan, right? So Julian is like, hey, by the way, you know, enjoy these mushrooms. Have you noticed Bunny's acting weird? And Richard playing it off is like, what are you talking about? And Julian is like, Bunny is one of the least morally concerned boys I have ever known. And all he talks about is God and consequences and jail and doing the right thing. And I swear if that Marion is making our Edwin turn into a religious freak, I'm going to be so mad. William thinks that Marion is, <laughs> is influencing Bunny to be more hypercritical and more you know, morally, ethically correct. And Richard's like, well, she is a Presbyterian. So, you know, there's that. And Julian's like, oh my God. If we were gonna lose him to anybody, at least we would lose him to the Catholics because they have a sense of beauty and grace. God forbid we lose our dear bunny to the Presbyterians. And he says that he has a implacable contempt for basically all Judeo-Christian religions and traditions and this seems to satisfy him for the time being. So April comes, it's spring, Hamden is getting much warmer, it's nicer outside, Richard's kind of like, okay, everything's, you know, status quo. So one day, Bunny just knocks on Richard's door and Richard's like, hey, come on in, Bun. Realizes he's absolutely plastered. And he starts to tell Richard about the farmer. Richard is like, well, I can't really stop him and say that they already told me because if I did that, that would be worse. So Richard listens as Bunny tells him the entire story of what happened with the farmer, Bacchidae, throwing with Henry, everything. Before he leaves, Bunny is like, tell anybody, tell everybody, I don't care. Richard is like, oh my god, this is not good because what if he tells Cloak or worse, what if he tells Marion? So Richard calls up Charles, okay, and he's like, listen, Bunny just came to me and told me everything, so Charles panics, says, come on over, I'm calling Henry. The time Richard gets to the twins' apartment, Charles is like, I've been ringing Henry, I've been ringing Henry, I cannot get him on the phone. And Camilla's like, oh, wait, I can get him on the phone. So she says, we have this secret code where ring twice, hang up, and then ring again, and then we'll know it's each other. And Charles is like, <laughs> why do you have a secret code with henry and richard's kind of thinking like yeah why do you have a secret code with henry and charles is getting really butthurt and richard's like why are you getting so butthurt literally to the point where camilla's like it's not a secret it's just this code we adopted it i was gonna tell you relax and charles basically continues to badger her about it and she's literally like stop being such a baby and when she says that richard's like oh my god this is not gonna end well so charles and camilla there's tension henry and camilla they got a secret code when this was developed hmm i don't know but like i said about richard right the thing about richard is he's oblivious to what he doesn't want to be true so there are so many times in this book that they're at the country house and there's one in particular where he talks about henry and camilla coming downstairs from a nap and they were both sleep rumpled and their hair was wild and they were flushed obviously i don't think they were napping but richard lives in la la land so henry answers immediately with the code and he arrives and richard tells him everything and then he's like you know are you gonna poison him because something's gotta happen and everyone is basically at a loss for words because they don't agree with the poison plan but they also don't want to go to jail and they also don't trust bunny i think he will tell cloak specifically think he will tell Marion. He's kind of panicking and Henry is like, you know what? <laughs> Don't even worry about it. I got it. I'm actually gonna go. I gotta run some errands, but you know, make sure Richard go into Hamden Town, buy a newspaper, make sure people saw you out and about, just in case anyone's asking why you're out. And Richard's like, okay, whatever. So they all leave and Richard goes home and he literally is so depressed at this point that every time he's not with his class or in the Lyceum or the country house with Julian, whatever, he is sleeping and he calls this sleep a comfortable dead man's float only remotely disturbed by a chill undertow of reality. So Richard's not doing good. He goes to Henry's place where he finds Charles and Francis. He's like, where's Camilla and where's Bunny? And they were like, well, Bunny and Marion, Cloak and Camilla, go with backwards, are all on a date together and Camilla is on a date but she's technically there to watch Bunny to make sure he doesn't say anything and Richard and Charles both are not <laughs> really happy about this but in the meantime Henry's talking to them and he begins to lay out his plan for what they're gonna do to Bunny and Henry basically says 
they are going to make it look like a hiking accident. So Bunny always takes hikes. He loves to go for walks. One thing you'll frequently see in the novel is he spends the least amount of time with the group and it's not normally said where he's off unless he's with Marion or some or Cloak or whatever. So a lot of the times he is taking these walks. Um, especially when it's nice and he's always asking the others to go for a walk with him. That being said, Henry notes that one of Bunny's usual routes goes right by a ravine. And he's like, are you laying down what I'm putting up? And everyone's kind of like, kind of. So Henry's like, this is what we're going to do. Bunny's going to take his usual hike, weather allowing. What we're going to do is sit on the opposite side of the trail, the route that passes the ravine. We're going to wait for Bunny. And when he comes, the plan is we are going to push him off the cliff. He says, although it relies on a bit of luck, he feels like this is the good plan. And honestly, when I first read it, I was like, I can't really see any flaws in it. He is much less convinced than Richard and all the others. He thinks there's too many variables, they're gonna get caught. But Henry being Henry convinces him, convinces the others that no matter what, they need to act soon because they need to avoid prison because Bunny is definitely going to say something so everyone agrees to this plan we're pushing bunny off the ravine literally charles is like are we going insane like he literally wonders aloud like have we all collectively lost the plot like is this dionysian madness like have do we have fully ado times however many people are here henry basically spends the rest of the night convincing everybody that there is no other option but to, but to get rid of Bunny and once everyone agrees Henry is like okay Richard I feel like you know you should leave the less you know the better I don't want you to get caught up in this you know you can have deniable probability or whatever Richard being the idiot he is is like okay cool thank you so on his way home he runs into Camilla who is drunk, but she's in a good mood and she's coming from the date so you know her spirits are high and Richard taking this chance that he sees questionable tells Camilla to come home with him as this big romantic you know lusty gesture and she denies his advances but gives him a little quick kiss and then continues on her way so he's like on cloud nine because he got this little peck even though he literally just got pied to the face so Richard you know in his days he does not get up sleeps through his alarms and when he wakes up it's the afternoon and he's like, what the hell's going on? And he goes outside and he runs into Judy Poovy, our girly Judy. And she lets him know that there is a party on campus today called Swing Into Spring. And it's basically everybody on campus comes in and everyone's partying outside. It's this big thing. And then Richard is like, damn, how are we going to take care of him with all these people on campus? What is Henry going to do? So Judy tells Richard that Bunny's in the library and he should bring him by to party later. Richard's like, heard you, goes to the library, looks for Bunny. Bunny is not there, but he finds a note that Bunny left for Marion. It reads, bored stiff, walk down to the party to get a brewski, see you later. Richard is like, okay, so Bunny's at the party, he's drinking. Okay, this is kind of good, this is kind of good. He's not going to go for a hike, but maybe he'll go for a walk when he's drunk. He tends to do that. So he's trying to call Henry to let him know, hey, you know, we need to switch up the plans because Bunny's not going to be alone. He might be with Marion. Oh, he's calling, he's calling, he's not answering. So Richard's like, okay. I need to go save their skin because they might just do something stupid. So he puts his jacket on and he runs over to the side and he eventually finds them and tells them that Bunny is not going to be taking his normal walk because he is at Spring in the Fling, or Spring into, Fling into Spring, Spring into Fling, whatever, Spring, Swing into Spring, okay? And they're all pissed and they're all salty and just as they're about to leave, they hear some footsteps and who comes walking down the trail but Edmund, Bunny, Corcoran. He's taking his leisurely stroll, right? He's drunk. He's like, wait, why is everyone here? And he immediately gets like confused. He's like, where are we all supposed to meet? Are you guys hanging out with me? Etc. Etc. He makes like a few sarcastic like little digs again, just like getting that last little needle in. And everybody at this point is just so exhausted with him and tired that as he makes these remarks, Henry walks forward with this wide smile on his face. And Bunny's like, what's up, Henry? As we know, boom, Bunny goes over the ravine. Now, Richard doesn't describe in like really intense detail what happened the exact moment, but instead he basically pauses and he reflects upon what they did, how disturbing it was. And he says his death haunts him and he kind of describes it as a 
impressionistic surreal afterthought he talks about how though he participated in it he doesn't necessarily feel like a bad person and he says i have never considered myself a very good person neither can i believe myself that i am a spectacularly bad one i guess i believe he dissociated a little bit when the actual event occurred knowing that he was trying to prevent it and then in that accidentally ended up being there when it happened now implicating himself and tying himself to them for the rest of his life which he just saw what happens when you're tied to them and they decide that they want to cut those ties so that's all going through his head and richard lets us know in the present that bunny's death does haunt him and it haunts his dreams and he reflects on the fact that he was able to be convinced to you know bunny very easily and in such a short amount of time and he talks about how impressionable he was and he reflects on the fact that who he was nowadays he never could have been convinced and never would have thought himself capable of such an act again that goes back to the cult like mentality and how easy it is to be persuaded by these godlike figures who are like adored and you're enamored by so while they are escaping the scene of the you know crime they're in henry's car and it's getting stuck in the mud and they're panicking and they're like we're gonna get caught this is crazy so i'm looking for him and we're gonna be done for but henry's like relax he's super chill everyone's panicking he gets the car out of the mud and together they just go to the country house and they come up with a plausible alibi for richard because they all have them and richard does not because he was seen fleeing the library <laughs> right when buddy was walking so they're like what are we gonna do this is hectic they're all at the country house it's april it's spring he's in the ravine he's gonna be found like tomorrow morning and richard's looking out the window and he's like it's snowing so nobody's really paying attention richard notes that it's snowing and henry is just worried about an alibi and he says listen if anybody asks you you were in the commons then you went home and then you came to the country house with us that's it that all and you ran from the library basically because you were trying to meet us and that's it and you need to go home and Richard's like yeah I need to go home so Richard is walking home and as he is walking the snow is falling and it's getting deep he's like noting how much it's snowing and he's thinking back to the hippie house and it's like really 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 coming down and when he gets home he just tries to read and he can't focus and he feels like for the first time he's really really affected by this so he calls francis and henry and he's like hey you know can we hang out can we do something and henry's like yeah i don't think that's a good idea like i don't think we should you know be around each other i don't think we should be seen together and richard's like okay well i'm having a panic attack and i'm going insane and my thoughts are racing I don't know what to do and henry's like why don't you just think in another language you know it'll help slow your thoughts down and richard's like that's not helpful but before he can even say anything henry just hangs up and richard is like okay um i don't want to keep bugging him because i don't want to end up like bunny so he goes to find judy during that conversation judy tells richard that she saw bunny earlier that day and that causes richard to like space out because he's like what <laughs> you saw bunny alive and judy's like yeah i saw him alive and she's basically like just going on and on about her acting class and she's telling him about her monologue and at the end of this big long spiel which richard has just dissociated through she's like do you want to go to a party richard is like yeah i am down let's party i need to get out of here so he goes to the party and surprise surprise the pill that judy gave him is not a sleeping pill but it is in fact an opioid so he is at the party whacked out of his mind and having the best night of his life and at this party under the influence he's really reflecting on his time so far at hamden and how he's missed out on hanging out with so many people like judy's friends or other majors and how he really removed himself from hamden college and enrolled in julian's little university of five and he's kind of sad that he feels like he doesn't know these people because they are good people and they look fun and there's like some art students that are using paintbrushes as chopsticks and he thinks it's funny even though he's like I wouldn't want to be friends with them whatever so he's just partying and he sees some random girl and he's like you're cute and they start making out and Richard's like you want to come home with me and she's like absolutely so you know they go home they do what grown-ups do and Richard is sleeping next to her and he has this creepy dream that him and Charles are on a train trying to avoid a third passenger. He wakes up and he's really upset and he just looks down at the girl and he realizes that the girl that he's um the girl that he had brought with him lives in the same dorm as Bunny and it really really upsets him so without thinking he kind of just 
leaves her in his room, puts his clothes on, and he heads over to Francis's apartment. Richard arrives at Francis's house, and Francis is like, what the hell? But of course he lets him in because Richard looks really worse for wear and Francis is like, oh my god, come in. I will make you some tea and he makes some tea. And they're basically just talking back and forth about the situation and the conversation kind of dies down and they're sitting in silence and then all of a sudden, Francis just kind of looks at Richard, leans in and kisses him. And at first Richard is kind of shocked, but he immediately starts kissing him back. <laughs> He said, shocked but not scared, baby, ask about me. After a moment, Richard kind of pulls away and he's like, Francis, stop, no, stop. And Francis replies, it's fun, I promise you. And they start to like move to second base, you know, little hands in the, in the action. But before they can actually do the big one, they're interrupted by a knock at the door and they like spring apart two bros sitting in the hot tub anyways francis enters the door and it's charles standing outside charles is upset and absolutely wasted at this point charles drinking has really become a problem ever since bunny he has just been drinking his sorrows away but francis lets him in anyways even though he knows charles is not the best when he's drunk and he says there's still no news about bunny and that henry is pissed about the weather because it's snowing and he's like oh by the way we also have greek homework due the following day if y'all haven't done that so they all like freak out want to keep up appearances because remember they're immaculate students their entire life is julian and his class so if julian starts to see them slip in the academics he's going to know something's up they make tea sober up and complete their work but while charles is sobering up francis and richard and him are kind of just sitting in silence weighing the pain and like the heaviness of everything that they did so the next day they go to the lyceum they go to class and they act as everything is normal and richard says that henry walks in looking calm well rested and more than he had any right to be so richard is kind of clocking the fact that henry is not that bothered but that bunny is gone so julian's like hey speaking of bunny where's bunny oh okay we'll just wait a couple minutes i'm sure he'll come in and the rest of them are kind of like Mm, I don't know I don't think we but whatever they play along and eventually Julian's like okay I don't know what this kid is but we need to get started so they go on and they do class as usual after that again we are with Miss Judy P and he lets Richard know that the girl that Richard went home with the other day is a girl named Mona Beale and she says Mona is in a relationship and her boyfriend assaulted the last person he thought was flirting with Mona so you need to watch out because her boyfriend on one and richard shrugs us off and he's like i do not care she was flirting with me hitting on me i brought her home she was willing he can basically get over it so judy's like okay i was just letting you know like i'm not the police whatever enjoy your night and richard goes about his way and that night he goes to sleep and he has a terrifying dream about bunny once again but this time bunny is drowning in the bathtub and when richard wakes up he goes to the bathroom to splash water on his face and he looks in the mirror and he just starts to sob and he's just sobbing and dry heaving and he's really 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 upset and he just looks in the mirror and wonders if he's gonna be able to keep himself together after what they did to Bunny. Oh, again, he spends his day just doing his homework, contemplating the next night he goes to the twins' house for dinner with Charles, Henry, Camilla, and Francis. And Henry's like, hey, listen, I need you to do something for me. I need you to buy two tickets to two movies in Hamden Town, go see them, report back to me and Francis, remember them in detail, and tell us what happened. He's like, I would go see another one. We're using double movies as our alibi, but I don't want anybody to be suspicious. Even though he's making Richard do this, which is very suspicious. So he's like, okay, fine, I'll do it. Richard goes, the movies are literally horrendous, and he reports it back to others, tells them, they're like, thank you. And while he's gone, Charles just forges his homework for him so Julia won't notice. Again, still trying to keep up appearances. So keep in mind, it has been snowing this entire time. So the next day, Henry gets a call from Marion and she says, Hey, Hen, I know, you know, we don't like each other and like we hate each other, whatever, but have you happened to see Bunny? Like, has he been with you guys? What is the case? And Henry's like, No, actually, I haven't seen Bunny. That's really weird. We've been looking for him too. And when he hangs up the phone, he's kind of like annoyed irritated and he calls the others to let them know and he's like i hope the weather breaks soon like it needs 
to stop snowing so people can find him, see that he fell, and it doesn't turn into like a bigger missing persons case. Not only is Marion asking about Bunny, but when they go to class, Julian is like, okay, this is bizarre. Not only is Bunny not come to class, which say what you want about Edmund, but he is, you know, reliable enough to come to class. Julian has reached out to him himself and Bunny has not replied. So they're all like, wow, that's so weird. That's so crazy. So they're Bunny's best friends, right? If they don't show concern, it's going to look weird. So a couple days later, Henry's like, listen, I'm calling Marion. So he calls Marion. He's like, hey, Marion, I know you called me the other day. I don't know if Bunny's mad at me or something or if he's mad at us, but have you seen him? If so, tell us to call, tell him to call us. We're sorry for whatever we did, blah, blah, blah. So Marion is like, okay, wow. I'm actually shook because I thought maybe y'all knew something, but y'all don't know anything. I haven't heard from him or saw him but somebody saw him earlier today. Now, you would think that would like make Henry feel okay because there's like, you know, more suspicion and more like, is he alive? Is he just missing? Like the police aren't gonna be on it. But Henry on the other hand wants this wrapped up. He just wants them to find the body, declare that he fell from the ravine and be done with it. So this irks him. So the Thursday after Bunny's unfortunate demise, Julian has reached his like boiling point. He's like, listen, I know something is up this is weird y'all need to tell me what is going on and if you don't tell me i'm gonna like try to figure it out myself and it's pretty worked up but he's just firing question after question and henry cool as a cucumber as ever is feeling all of his questions remaining calm and kind of backing julian into a corner where he can't really argue with what he's saying even though richard is like yeah i'm not buying it richard is like we have an issue julian is he's gonna get to the point eventually where he's gonna want answers but they can't worry about that because ladies later that night francis and henry come to richard's place and they say hey we think marion and her friends have told campus security that bunny's missing maybe marion and cloak did so have you seen camilla because we need her to go investigate and richard's like i haven't seen camilla and why did you think she would be here and they don't say anything and richard kind of thinks it's weird that they thought camilla would be in his room with him alone late at night but he digresses so they leave and they go to the twins' house where they find charles camilla and who cloak rayburn cloak is all freaking out because bunny's missing right and they were like okay well what does this have to do with you well cloak is known around campus to supply some party supplies to people when necessary and basically everybody knows this it's kind of known that he is the plug so he tells them the story of a time that he took bunny to new york because bunny was begging to ride along with him to learn to learn to learn and they went to this warehouse to meet these guys and get this stuff and it was like real deal like even they scared cloak and bunny like couldn't speak when he said there he didn't say a word don't look them in the eyes real deal and he's worried that bunny may have went up there tried to make a deal with them himself to get his own to sell and accidentally got pooped on alive and he literally says these guys will chop you up and put you in a garbage bag for 20 bucks if you make them mad so he is worried that he is going to be implicated bring down this crime syndicate and end up getting whacked like bunny did <laughs> henry is like oh this is this is great like this is divine intervention this is this is the gods on our side he's like oh yeah cloak like that's that could be it like that could be it so he's hyping cloak up and cloak's like you know we should break into Bunny's apartment. He lets them know that he and Marion had previously contacted campus security to try to get them to let them into Bunny's place and they would not do that. So Henry being Henry volunteers Charles to go with Cloak to break into Bunny's apartment. And then he wonders aloud like, hmm, should I have done that? Like, is Cloak gonna realize something in Bunny's apartment is weird or is missing? And should I have sent Charles with him? But he doesn't really care and he's just like, I hope that tomorrow somebody finds Bunny or we start looking for him because I'm tired of this. I just want to wrap it up. They're waiting for Charles to come back. They're all playing cards and everyone is really nervous and they're worried about Charles and they're worried about Cloak. And Henry is, again, completely unfazed and the more time passes, the more upset they are getting and the more they're like, you know, spinning out of control with what they think happened. So Charles finally comes back sans cloak and the first thing he says is somebody fix me a drink. When he returns, he says the first thing that he noticed about Bunny's apartment was the newspaper article about the farmer was on his desk and Charles quickly disposed of it before Cloak could see it. But he worries that there could be other clues in the apartment that would kind of like allow like the police to connect the dots that perhaps 
they were involved somehow or Bunny was involved, ergo they were involved with the farmer. The apartment, Marion comes because obviously she notices what they're doing and Cloak and Marion look through and they notice that Bunny's stuff is there and he would not leave without all these amazing things. He wouldn't go somewhere, go and go to his parents without telling them or anything. So they're really freaked out. They call campus security who then calls the police. So now we have the police involved. Charles is there. He manages to sneak away. Before he sneaks away, the police find Bunny's wallet. <laughs> and a crowd is now forming because, again, it's in this tiny little dorm. And they're like, what is going on? Nothing like this ever happened to Hamden. So when this crowd is forming, Charles sneaks away, goes back, and he tells the others that the police said, we need to contact this boy's family. We found his wallet. Something's not right here. And he warns them that the police now all have everyone's name because they are associated with Bunny. They are known to be his best friends on campus. Henry, again, unfazed. Francis starts freaking out. This is not doing well. His nerves are frazzled through this whole thing. Him and Charles are really hanging on by a thread. But everyone else is like, okay, well, we can't really do anything. So Henry is like, just go back to campus. Act like everything's normal. And Richard's like, fine. He drives them back and they want to maintain everything is normal. So they're just doing regular things, you know, like checking their mailbox and stuff and they go to check their mailbox and they see a questionnaire asking them to review Julian and his classes. So Richard is like, oh my god, I don't really want to do this, but whatever, he sits at his desk and watches that Henry fills out his form and notices that Henry has taken 19 classes with Julian. So not only has Henry never taken classes with anybody else at Hamden College, he has been taught solely by Julian for every single thing. Richard is alarmed by this and he kind of has this moment of clarity where he wipes his eyes and he's like, this is not normal. This is not, how can one man command another? And Henry's like, listen, Julian's a genius. And he basically rates him perfect, five stars all the way. And there's a little comment section and Richard fills out his form and he looks at Henry and he's like, you're not gonna write a comment? You don't have any critiques? And Henry's baffled at the idea that someone would critique Julian Morrow and he says, and I quote, how can I possibly make the Dean of Studies understand that there is a divinity within our midst? And that is just something I just wonder if the Dionysus they saw that they referred to in the, you know, Bacchanal was actually Julian because we know that Julian knows about the farmer and does not care, um, does not hold their hands to the fire and finds it all to be very mystical and magical and and oh the drama of it all whatever you know he's weird so richard goes home and this time he's not spending any time with the greeks he's just you know in his bed in his room doing his thing and he is just a bundle of nerves he can't sleep he barely eating so he decides to call Camilla, and he's like listen just tell me a story like tell me something to get my mind off it and Camilla, being her lovely depressing self tells a story about the one and only time that she saw her father he was throwing rocks at their windows trying to get their attention when they were little bitty babies and she almost crawled out of her crib and she almost made it and right at the last second her uncle came up and lifted the crib up and gave her a measuring tape to play with the kind that snaps back and forth you know and she said that her uncle just looked at her and said poor kid poor baby and richard's like oh okay and she's like me and charles used to fight over that measuring tape all the time and richard is kind of just like um you're like a little too human for me so i'm gonna go to bed morning once again camilla wakes him up because she says the police are questioning charles and henry and bunny's disappearance and he needs to come outside because it has led to a media circus all over campus he's like what hops out of bed gets dressed prepares for the coming day and he's like out the hallway i'll see you there on the way though sees judy who is like i am so sorry i know bunny's disappeared blah blah blah, blah trying to offer her condolences and rich Richard is like too preoccupied to figure out what's going on to talk to the other students that he just kind of books past her so when he goes outside he realizes that yeah yeah this has become a media circus basically flooded the campus because of the story of the all-american intellectual fun-loving bunny corcoran going missing from a small town in upstate vermont and camilla also lets richard know that the corcorans have put up a significantly large amount of money for reward leading to bunny's safe return or any information about his disappearance which richard finds quite ironic but also quite stressful because that brings a lot more attention and a lot more eyes onto them and also aided in the media circus well 
Henry finds this out and he's like, don't worry. Charles and I got questioned the police, but it was fine. Like nobody cared. It was okay. They think everything's going to be fine. So that Friday, they decide to drive to Julian's and Richard is like so excited because he has never been to Julian's place. Curious to see how he lives, curious to see what it's like. And his house is beautiful. It's impressive. But unfortunately, Julian isn't home. So they're like, okay, let's just go back to campus, I guess. This was a waste. So they go back and they drop the twins off at home. And then Henry, Richard, and Francis realize there is a search party for Bunny on campus. So they go and join that search party and they search Hamden College, the Running Woods, all of that for a long time before people begin to, you know, leave and kind of shut down for the night. And when everyone starts to leave, these three slowly dissipate and make their way home as well. After this volunteering, Henry picks everybody up and they go to Francis's house in the country and they're eating dinner and they're watching the news together where this man, William Hundy, who I did not put on my board because you will see why in a minute, <laughs> is giving an interview to a local reporter about how he saw Bunny getting into a Lasans with three other men. So now we have a outsider who does not go to Hamden College, does not know the twins, and does not know Bunny, saying that he saw him in Hamden Town. Doesn't implicate the other Greek students, but Henry, of course, is worried that this man saying this will turn this into a big criminal investigation and that people will come looking even harder for Bunny because he's like, the actual crime? Yeah, that's shaky to pin on us, but if they look in the bank records or if they talk about the Rome trip or if anything's written down, we are going down. So he's not happy about it. And in the middle of all of this, while they're trying to figure this out, who calls but Mr. Corcoran, Bunny's father, and invites everybody, with the exception of Richard, because like, he doesn't know who Richard is, to their hotel for dinner. The others leave to go and Richard basically just drinks himself asleep. And at six in the morning, Francis wakes Richard up and says, we just spent the entire night drinking with the Corcorans. They're staying at this like little nasty roach motel that has a neon sign and no room service. And when we left, they were still drinking. He's like, it was terrible. They're horrible people. They weren't even really worried about Bunny being gone. They were just loving all this attention. It seemed to us like they did not give a rat's butt. And he says, oh, and by the way, the National Guard is coming to Hamden Town. So you need to get up because they were called and they will be arriving shortly. And Richard is like, okay okay this conversation richard is up and he's getting dressed and before he can even think to do something henry calls him and francis and says listen come and join this search party you need to get here francis is exhausted and doesn't want to go but literally is like okay if i don't go that's gonna look terrible so he ultimately complies and the two of them head over to campus where they see things have now gotten completely out of control it's a full-blown circus there's hundreds of people showing up in drags to look for bunny and richard's nerves are shot meanwhile <laughs> they walk up on henry who is just reading with absorbed interest a tiny vellum bound book written in some near eastern language but they all form a group and cloak shows up tells them that he contacted the distributor of north who claims to have never seen bunny and he's worried that the others might have told the police about that initial theory and that it's gonna blow back on him if they try to you know find those people in New York and then he's gonna get caught. And Henry's like, listen, we didn't say anything, Cloak. You're good. You are safe. You are safe. The entire day they basically look for Bunny. They're searching through the woods and everybody, I mean everybody, uh, George LaForge is there and even Julian. He says, you know, this is crazy. I can't believe Bunny's missing. He tells them that he saw Bunny's family and briefly talked to them and he just says they're abhorrent. He hates the Corcorans, like despises them. Although he doesn't outwardly say so, Richard can tell by what how Julian is acting. And Richard is kind of just, you know, standing back watching Julian talk about not liking the Corcorans. And he's like, you know, Julian is genuinely concerned about Bunny. I can see that. I can see that Julian is genuinely concerned that Bunny's missing. But Richard is like, I know Julian and I know some part of him secretly enjoys the big operatic drama, like the spectacle of it all. Him and Henry are a sucker for spectacle. So the sun is going down and everybody is leaving the search party. And as they are leaving, two FBI agents come up and they approach Charles and they say, come with us. And everyone's like, huh? 
what but richard is really freaking out and there's nothing they can do they're just waiting around hoping that charles will be okay so after that they go back to the twins apartment find charles just you know drunk once again and he reveals that he was fingerprinted and questioned by the fbi he says he doesn't think he revealed anything but it's honestly difficult to tell because the FBI agents are completely different than the Hamden police and he basically impresses upon the others how important it is to not underestimate their intelligence because there were several times he felt like they were trying to trick him or trip him up and he said that the agents had a lot of questions about Henry's trip to Italy with Bunny. Those notes they never asked specifically who funded the trip or if they split the cost between the two. And Charles continues to say, you know, they asked me this, they asked me that, but he says, ultimately, I don't think they have their eyes on any of us. I think they're pointed towards Cloak and the whole New York City thing. Then that night, William Hundy is on the news and he's basically talking about the time that he saw Bunny and he decides to say that he saw Bunny with three Arab men. So they're all together and they're watching this and they are absolutely dumb struck. They are like, what the hell is this man doing? Because they know this is completely untrue and they're like, okay, the FBI has to know that this guy is clearly just looking for attention. And also when they were interviewing Mr. Mundy, they decided to you interview Miss Corcoran. Richard describes the Corcoran's interview as uh, very performative and very, um, disingenuine they're all pretty critical and they're like oh she's so gross she she doesn't even seem to care that bunny's missing she just cares about herself and they all basically you know agree that she's a rat with the exception of francis and then charles kind of mocks him and says you know the only reason you like miss corcoran is because she kisses up to you because of how you know much money you have charles goes on to tell richard that the corcorans are incredibly vain so much so to the point where they have a gucci room in their house that is painted with the red Gucci stripes and Richard is like wow that seems like something Bunny's parents would do. So Richard is like wow that's this is a lot I'm gonna go home have a good night y'all so he sets out back to campus and he's just walking do 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 you know doing his thing and all of a sudden just boop out of left field he gets socked in the face and he drops to the ground and then he gets a couple kicks to the ribs and he is like what is going on and all of a sudden he hears stay away from Mona remember Judy's friend, Monobile, boyfriend is crazy, beats him up, leaves him on the ground, and he's like, okay, I, okay. Goes back to his dorm, the next day he wakes up and he is just over it. He goes to class and Julian is like, what the hell happened? And instead of telling a lie to cover up something, he doesn't want someone to know. This is one of the first times that Richard actually replies with truthfulness and he just tells Julian what happened and he's honestly like surprised. He's kind of like taken aback, he didn't think he would say that. And he lets Richard know that the FBI actually came and talked to him about Bunny and Julian was like, I thought they were gonna talk about the Israeli government who's cr exiled crown princess I tutored and Richard's like, what? He's like, yeah, 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 you know, like I was a tutor for this exiled princess, whatever. But he said, no, they asked me about Bunny and told him that Bunny was on rugs with a D. Richard's like, what? And Julian's like, do you think that's the case? And Richard's like, uh, but doesn't say anything, he doesn't answer, which Julian finds highly, highly suspicious. And Richard's like, listen, I gotta go. So nice to talk to you. See you when I see you. And later that night, Henry tells everyone that he too was spoken to the FBI and he feels like far more confident that they're worried about this whole cloak, you know, drug business thing than they are with Bunny. And Richard is like, okay, that's true. But if we point them in Cloak's direction, that could come back to bite us because Cloak could implicate us and start spinning a story about how we're close friends and he didn't know Bunny like we did and all of this stuff. Although Henry's like, whatever, I don't care. This is okay. This is fine. Henry's remaining cool, calm, collected this entire time. They're fearless leader. Later that night, again, we're getting updates of them basically watching the nightly news, seeing the case developed as it goes. It has basically turned into a full-blown story about dealers and crime in this underground CD world. And this has largely to do with the fact that in Bunny, when the police searched Bunny's room, they found a mirror that had some Pepsi residue all over it. And everyone who knows Bunny is like, okay, he probably stole that mirror from Laura Stora, who is this girl on campus that's known as the Snow Queen because you know she 
keep that white girl Christina Aguilera so this plate this stolen tray that everyone has attributed to being bunnies and solely bunnies is kind of like the community line tray this freaks cloak out so much that nobody can find him and Judy's like cloak I think he fled and they find out that yes indeed cloak did try to leave campus and he was arrested when he tried to leave so they brought him back to hamden and he refused to speak without an attorney and while this is happening the media is quickly turning on the corcoran family they're seeing all the things that the classic kids were kind of saying and they interview you know miss corcoran about the drugs being involved and she's adamant she's like my son would never my bunny would never and of course they're getting all these stories from the press and hamden is a huge party college if that was not made clear this is like you don't go here to do work you just go here to vibe it says that would you believe the corcoran's to the point that the headline the next day was mom says s-e-z not my kid making fun of the all-american fake vibrato new money you know shtick that the corcoran's do so after that they're kind of like okay well this is turning into something we never thought it would be whatever they're kind of just going about business as usual trying not to raise suspicion and it's monday night and camilla and richard are just hanging out and richard's like you know what i'm gonna finally ask camilla what happened to you why were you unable to speak for weeks why were you completely clean but you only had red in your hair and camilla's like listen i don't really know what happened during the ritual i know there was a fifth person there you know he wasn't always a figure at some point he was and he was walking with us and she says this was dionysus and richard's like okay if you say so and she says you know i remember seeing the farmer's body and ironically enough camilla the only girl goes into the most grotesque and in-depth detail we have of the body so far and she talks about seeing the steam coming from his open stomach and it's all just like really disgusting and talks about seeing his entrails and all of that lovely stuff but also let's richard in on a little known fact that henry failed to mention but after they slaughtered the farmer henry had them slaughter some piglets and pour the blood on themselves which that's interesting and richard is horrified and camilla's like no it's because blood can clean blood and in ancient societies the only thing that could clean blood was a blood debt was more blood and richard's like that makes no sense and camilla's like don't worry i don't think henry will have us do it again because he know it will upset you he's just like huh like who died and made henry the boss of us we're just like whatever he's looking at camilla like i don't know about you girl and charles comes home and he's annoyed he's mad that richard and camilla are alone together and he's like why are you alone with my sister why are you here with my sister by yourself da, 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 da. and richard is just like okay i'm leaving i'm not doing this i don't know what's going on with you two but now he's starting to see some writings on the wall and he's like i think i've seen this film before and i didn't like the ending but at this point the police are desperate they're bringing in psychics they're bringing in dogs and richard's telling them all of this and he kind of laughs off the psychic part and henry's like that's the part i'm most worried about and richard is kind of just like um that makes no sense what and henry's like annoyed at him and he's like you laugh off everything that you can't see exist you you doubt the existence of everything that you can't see and richard is kind of like oh you might have gagged me a little bit richard's kind of like a little irritated with henry so him and charles are kind of hanging out and charles is like richard let's go into town drive me and let's have some food and richard's like whatever let's go to the brasserie so they go to a local bar and they're eating and charles is basically silent the entire meal but he is drinking he is drinking heavily richard is taking note of the drunker he's getting the angrier he's getting and richard is like we need to get out of here soon well the restaurant is playing again the nightly news and once again william hundy is on the program and this time there is a middle eastern man who is also on the program and he is debating the characterizations that william hundy has made about arab people and about middle eastern people in general so they're kind of going back and forth and this guy is rightfully so calling out hundy on his stereotype and this man just loses it he calls them a horrible word that i will not say he says every terrible thing that you can think of that could be used against you know somebody from the middle east and when he is like being disgusting and bigoted the bar that they're in starts to like cheer and clap and like cheer him on and richard and charles look up and they're like okay we need to get out of here because if y'all agree with what this man is saying what what, what like this cannot be so they get out of there they go back to the twins apartment and they knock out for the night the next morning charles is basically asleep dead to the world Millet and richard hear the sound of an ambulance and they jump out of bed and they're like what's going on now? Now, and they realize it's parked beneath their window and then they realize that a student named holly goldsmith has found 
Bunny's body when she was on a walk with her dog. So Henry comes out of the room, him and Richard and Camilla go downstairs to the ambulance and they are just bombarded by the media. They're questioning Bunny's disappearance. How do you feel about your friend? You know, is it true that he was involved in this? And they are just like deer in the headlights. Absolutely allegory intended. They are like, get away from us, you absolute vultures. And the FBI agents kind of swoop in and save them. And later Henry talks to them. And Henry's like, what do you think happened to Bunny? Like, what's going on? Tell us what happened to our friend. And the FBI agents are like, well, we don't really think that he killed himself, but you know, we can't really find anything and don't have any other leads. And the one FBI agent has to say something and the other FBI agent is like, <clears throat> cut it. And for some reason, this really triggers Camilla who begins sobbing and crying. And the FBI agent is like, oh my God, you miss your friend. Like, I'm so sorry. Like, do you want to ride home? She accepts. And then before they leave, the FBI agent's like, yeah, we're getting out of here. We're just going to leave this to the Hamden Town Police because no federal crime was committed. So sorry about your friend and keep it safe. I'm walking with the FBI agents and they're all, it's okay, sweetheart, we understand, you know, fawning all over her. And Richard is just standing there disassociating while everyone's kind of figuring out like what's going on. And he describes this feeling as an incomplete dreamscape that was like a sketch from the world you knew. An amnesia land, a kind of skewed heaven where the old landmarks were recognizable but space too far apart. That is just beautiful. Oh my God. Donna's heart, her imagery is amazing. The idea that they are most likely going to get away with what they did to Bunny and he comes back into view and he looks around and he's just kind of dissociating and out of the corner of his eye he spots an old shoe. And it's not Bunny's shoe, it's not anybody's shoe that he knows but for some reason this shoe has a distinct impact on Richard and it makes him feel very solemn and very somber and to this day he says that he remembers it. After Bunny is found it's basically turned into like a mourning party. Everybody is coming out of the woodwork and just pawning over him about how good of a person he is. The college donates to the ACLU in Bunny's honor which is funny because Richard described the ACLU as an organization Bunny would have certainly abhorred had he been aware of its existence. Everything that the college does, all the upcoming events, they somehow figure a way to incorporate Bunny and even communities that hated him such as like the hippies and the gay community find a way to mourn his passing and the entire campus really sad and they feel duller to not have Bunny walking around Hamden. Thing Richard realizes is that all the people coming out of the woodwork, all the people mourning, are all the friends that Bunny had that he was spending time with when he wasn't with the group. Not only Richard but the reader get to realize how little Bunny actually assimilated into their little group, into their cult, why that made him the most dangerous of all and why that eventually led to Henry feeling like they had to do what they had to do. After, you know, they find Bunny, he is, Richard's not really hanging out with anybody. They're kind of just getting their footing. Henry, believe it or not, goes up to Connecticut with Bunny's parents, the Corcorans, and he is staying with them because the Corcorans are like, Bunny loved you. You were his closest friend. Like, it's giving, uh, what's that one with... He was too old to play it. He doesn't really know where the rest of them are, but he kind of has no interest in hanging out with them. So he's like, I'm gonna hang out with my only other friend, Judy Poovy, and you know, they're hanging out and Richard is kind of trying to lean on her and Judy is like, I'm trying to get some of that. So she tries to hook up with Richard and it's been known that Judy has been basically trying to get with Richard the entire time since she's met him. And he declines the offer, he's not interested, and he's like, I'm gonna leave. And she's like, whatever. So he goes and he briefly sees Francis and Francis tells him that Bunny's parents want an autopsy and along with that Richard just feels guilty. He just can't sleep. He's like Bunny's gonna be chopped up. People are gonna see that he, you know, everything was fine, that he really did fall and his parents are just gonna have to live with the fact that this was just a tragic accident. And ultimately the autopsy comes out and it reveals Bunny's cause of death and also reveals that at the time that he passed away there were no drugs in his system. So the Corcorans are redeemed, Bunny is redeemed, and now he goes from a wild party kid who died because of a bad drug deal to a all-American beloved football private school Americana Kennedy boy who took his life due to pressure. Oh captain my captain. After this comes out it kind of dies down, nobody's really worried about it. Henry sends Richard a letter and he's like hey why don't you come sleep at the Corcoran's house with me before the funeral? Please, I don't want to do this alone. Francis and this girl named Sophie Deerbold, who was like Bunny's acquaintance, quote, quote, 
um, they all travel to Connecticut to stay with the Corcoran family. They have a fun ride and Richard is like loving it and he says like he almost forgets that they're going to the Corcorans but he's like they pull up to the house and Richard is like this is the most ugliest tackiest biggest McMansion house I hate it and Francis is just like whatever let's just go inside. Dr. Corcoran comes to the door and he greets them warmly and he's all smiles and you know Sophie introduces herself to Mr. Corcoran who no idea who she is kind of getting the vibe that this might be Bunny's little uh sneaky link. Mr. Corcoran's just like welcome to the house and he's super bubbly and he's super jovial and all of a sudden I don't know where he just starts screaming crying he's down in like a almost comic way and Francis is like okay dude thank you for having us like okay cool. Richard is not as unconvinced as the rest. This moment scars him so much so that he says suddenly and for the first time really I was struck by the bitter irrevocable truth of it the evil of what we had done. This is kind of realizes that Richard's like disassociating and thinking about it so he literally just kicks him in the shin so he'll snap out of it and all of a sudden like on cue Mr. Corcoran stops crying and gets everyone inside for a beer and they're all kind of like what the hell and everyone's shocked except for Francis who's like yeah I'll come have a beer with you you know meaning he's definitely seen this before and he's seen what Bunny's family dynamic is like. So they go inside Richard is like hey hello how are you Mr. Corcoran nice to meet you. Immediately Mr. Corcoran's like oh I know you you're Richard you're Dickie boy my bunny loved you he told me all these stories about you and basically bigs Richard up bunny basically made Richard sound like this cool kid from California and really smart and you know on par with him so Richard feels like even more bad because bunny spoke nothing but highly of him to his parents so down comes Mrs. Corcoran and she brushes past them to get some flowers for her arrangement and she is again just nasty she's chastising the boy who brought the flowers saying that the let big enough, the last delivery wasn't good. Mr. Corcoran's trying to look around and you know see who's done send the flowers, say thank you. And she's kind of just like, ugh, whatever. Like I bet you Bob Bartle, who works for you, only sent a wreath because he like wants a raise. So he's very concerned about appearances, and Mr. Corcoran is barely holding it together and after that, Miss Corcoran just turns to Francis and she's like, Oh, you know, I love your mom. Like, I hope she's okay. I heard she got admitted into Betty Ford. And Francis is like, Yeah, she's fine. Thanks for airing my mom's business out. Miss Abernathy, you see her throughout the book. She has a very young husband. She took the money out in the beginning of the year. It's alluded to the fact that she has a little bit of addiction issues. He tries to drop the subject, but Mrs. Corcoran doesn't give a hint and just keeps harping on about it. And everyone's visibly annoyed and visibly upset. And Mr. Corcoran is just like, oh, Henry, hello, Henry. And Henry's coming down the stairs to greet them all and he kind of saves them from this like awkward conversation. Comes down and Mrs. Corcoran is just fawning over him and she's like, please take them to where they can stay, show them around, show them the accommodations. And Henry's kind of just standing there and Mr. Corcoran just like busts out again, sobbing, blubbering, spitting all over himself. And Henry is like, oh my God. And you get the gist that Miss Corcoran is not happy that her husband cannot keep it together. So he just like goes off and does the flowers and once again she's like, Henry, show them where they can stay. So Henry's like, all right, let's go. I'll bring you guys to the basement. This is where y'all can stay for the funeral. When they go downstairs, the basement has cots in it like literal cots and they're like okay no we are not doing this we are sleeping at a hotel and Henry's like we can't this is rude we have to indulge them and Camilla comes downstairs and she's like listen I had to sleep with Marion last night okay if I had to cuddle Marion y'all can sleep on these cots and she's also like Henry has been having migraines on migraines so he's been taking all his pills and he's almost out and this is just going down like a bag of sick. So they're in the Corcoran house and things are just not going good, okay? Richard and Camilla are digging through people's cabinets to find pills for Henry and they finally find them. Richard gives them to him, he's like, you've been drinking, be careful taking these, these are hectic. And he's like, Camilla, be careful on the phone because Cloak has been over listening to you. I see him in the comments all the time, he's trying to hear your conversations. He's like, I'm fine, stop worrying about me. And then he randomly just kisses her, so, okay. And Charles comes stumbling in, super drunk. Him and Francis are yelling and arguing because Charles left the top down on Francis's car. This is like, you ruined my car, it's gonna rain. And Charles is just really, really, really not doing good. So Francis just kind of drops it because he sees that Charles is a pretty dark place and he doesn't want to push it. Next day is the funeral. They all get up and go with the exception of Henry who is a pallbearer. So he's going to be carrying Bunny's casket with his brothers. How macabre is that? But Francis is like not dressed for Bunny's funeral. He's like, I can't do this. I need some air. I am overwhelmed. So he steps outside on the front porch to find Charles and Cloak smoking some of the devil's lettuce. Listen, we gotta go. Corcoran's losing her mind. We gotta get to the funeral for Bunny's funeral. And 
everyone rounds up and they make their way to the church so they're at the church and Richard is like oh my gosh he's sitting through it and he's describing it and there's this really cliche speech from Bunny's high school football coach talking about all his accolades to Richard's surprise Henry stands up and reads a poem about Bunny and his situation and Richard's kind of like oh okay this is very like macabre because all of them find the poem which is a poem by a e hausman called with rue my heart is laden to be in poor taste and i will just read that for you so you can see why so the poem goes as follows with rue my heart is laden for golden friends i had for many a rose lip maiden and many a light foot lad by brooks too broad for leaping the light foot boys are laid the rose lit girls are sleeping in field where roses flayed, sir, or fade, sorry, jeez. And they're like, Henry, this is really not the time nor the place, but of course, Henry doesn't care. She's like, listen, I don't care if you think it's appropriate or not. Bunny would say it all the time, and it really makes me think of him. And his mother is really, you know, moved by it and everything. Richard's like, whatever. And during the closing prayer, he's kind of just dissociating and he is not doing good he's like okay this is the end of the funeral this is it this is the closing of the chapter i'm supposed to move on from this and he is so his mind that he literally almost passes out he thinks he's gonna faint he like cannot hold it together he's holding on to the pews richard is like okay now we just are on to the socializing part of the funeral i'm forgetting what it's called you guys know what i'm talking about like i can get through this you know i can fake the funk this is what i'm good at so he's just at the funeral kind of putzing around not really talking to anybody and he overhears the corcoran talking to one of his friends and one of his friend's sons owns a huge percentage in the bank that mr corcoran works for so he's like all excited that he's here richard watched mr corcoran run off to go schmutz this guy and Richard's like, wow, even at his son's funeral, this man is networking and only caring about money. And Richard is just like disgusted. After that, they go to the cemetery to lay bunny to rest. And Richard and all of the classic students are watching as his casket is lowered into the ground. And they are all very upset, visibly upset. Richard literally says he finds the grave almost unbearable. He is so stricken with guilt as he watches Bunny's casket go in the ground that he again almost faints. And they're all sort of just like processing it in their own way. And right as he's lowered into the ground, Henry grabs a handful of dirt and tosses it onto Bunny's casket, which is something people do sometimes. But with his hand that is then covered in dirt, he takes it and wipes it across his white funeral shirt. And everyone, all the students are like, uh, they feel like he doesn't even realize what he just did because why would you just do that? And now he just has this huge dirty palm print wiped across his shirt. But after that, future Richard is like, listen, I took a whole bunch of pills. I do not know what happened. I had to be high as a kite to get through this. All I can tell you is Everyone left as soon as they could. Richard couldn't leave till four in the afternoon the next day and he just remembers that the twins are just barking at each other, they're biting, they're angry, and he's just like, every time I see them, they're bickering and he doesn't know why and he's like, this is very unlike them. It really bothers him, but he just is like, okay, I can't even deal with this right now. So he goes home. He is not really in the hangout mood, which is such a stark contrast to the Richard we meet at the beginning of the novel because he, he's desperate to be friends with them and we see how upset he is when he is left out of things for him to be the one to isolate himself and not want to be around them it's a really big deal and he just basically self-isolates and he mopes and he cries and really going through it and he thinks about his future and every night he goes to sleep and he has terrible dreams of bunny and he really cannot get past what they did it's kind of crippling him it's taking away all of his ability to focus on anything but bunny and his own guilt at this point guilt and anger are starting to overwhelm every single person in this friend group but at this particular point charles and camilla are really fighting richard's noticed that they're kind of fighting over something to do with henry but he's not really sure he just knows that they're always angry at each other and the fights are escalating and they're escalating every time he sees them they're fighting and because of this charles is drinking a ton and like I said throughout the novel Charles's drinking has been something that everyone's focused on but it's getting to the point where it's out of hand and he often 
is driving drunk he is falling asleep places he's wasting all of his money being gone for days they're not able to find him and because of all of this inner turmoil julian is like what the hell is going on because attendance to his class is like abysmal nobody's going to class nobody's doing their greek sometimes richard is the only person that shows up sometimes it's richard francis and henry sometimes it's just henry it's all over the place and julian is like something is going on but he's also like okay i know you guys lost money i feel sad too i don't really know what to do this is something i've never had to deal with and one thing about julian is as much as he loves to you know be as all-knowing all mystic he doesn't like change and we know this because when he's having a conversation with richard richard talks about how the classic mind is so different than the modern mind and the classic mind is unrelenting and narrow and obsessive so this little breaking of their world is also breaking julian richard's not doing great he is kind of starting to find a little bit of independence. He's going to sit house sit in Brooklyn for this professor for the summer. So he has a place to live. He knows he can get a job in New York. He's not worried about it at all. And he's finally like, I can be alone with my thoughts and be Richard. And I don't have to have anybody influencing me. And you're kind of like, yeah, you didn't have to do it all the time, but whatever. The group is kind of disbanded. They're seeing each other here and there, but it's not these weekends in the country house every day you're running to class because you're so excited but he's still friends with them and one night Richard actually gets a call and he's like who the hell is this and it's Francis and he's like oh hey hey boo and Francis is like hey I'm having a heart attack and Richard is like Francis is like I'm having a heart attack I'm freaking out I don't know what to do you're the med student Richard's like okay let's go to the ER I'm gonna drive you I don't think you're having a heart attack but we'll go to the hospital so when they're in the hospital Francis is acting up he's acting weird he's gasping he's wheezing grabbing his chest and Richard is like okay dude are you okay like what is going on with you and the doctors are like okay this kid's clearly like on something or whatever and Richard's like no I promise you I know Francis he's not on any and you may think he'd be on so they're like okay we'll run some tests and they run a whole bunch of tests and lo and behold he's not on anything and he's not having a heart attack and the doctor comes in and he's like hey you know uh your test came back clean and your heart's fine but i hate to tell you i think you just had a panic attack <laughs> you know i think you have anxiety and this was likely your first full-blown panic attack and after that Francis kind of sobers up and he's like, oh, okay, like, oh my gosh, like, oh, I feel silly. Thank you so much, doctor. And he feels really embarrassed when he's leaving. And Richard's just kind of like, are you okay? Like, you know, I know this was funny related. And Francis is like, yeah, no, I'm not okay, but I can't really do anything about it because I know I need a psychiatrist, but I can never tell anybody what happened. So it does not matter if I go because I will only ever be lying anyways, and that will make it worse. And Richard's like, yeah, I know what you mean. Hardcore will late. So they're like bonding over the fact that they feel very much trapped in this life that they do not want, which these two are just oh, my babies. So Richard goes home and Francis goes back to his apartment and he's like, okay, cool, whatever, back to studies. But then the next night, Richard is laying in bed again and he is awoken by another phone call and he's like, oh my God, what the hell? Who was it this time? And it is Mr. Henry Winter and he says, hey, I need you because Charles has been arrested for drunk driving. You need to come get some money from me so you can go bail him out. And Richard is like, oh my God, everybody is falling apart and they're coming to me and I don't think I can help them. I digress, okay. So Richard goes, grabs the money from Henry, goes to the jail and the guy's like, hey, your friend's gotta spend the night in jail. Bail hasn't been posted. He's not getting out until he sees the judge. And Richard's like, okay, whatever that means. Richard is like, okay, I can't leave Charles here, so I'm just gonna wait in the freaking police station till morning time. So he goes out, sits, he waits. Richard is like, okay, I guess I'll just wait here until the morning till his bail is posted, whatever. This is the payphone to call Henry, and he tells him the update, and Richard is like, why didn't you just bring your own money in your car and come down here and bail Charles out. And Henry's like, well, <clears throat> I feel like I'm the last person that Charles would want to see right now. And Richard is like, why? What happened? Like, secret secrets are no fun. Henry is like, okay, me and Charles got into a fight. It wasn't a big deal and we're kind of over it, but he was drunk and he's mad and I just don't want to make it worse if he's in police custody. I wanted to fight, so I just thought it would be better if you go. 
and Richard is like okay I'm not buying it and Henry is not willing to give any more details and Richard is just annoyed as hell so he hangs up on Henry. Richard is like alright whatever I'll wait. He goes to court, waits for Charles to get his bail, pays Charles his bail. Charles has his license suspended so now he cannot drive and he gets a court date set for his DUI case because obviously he's gonna have to face some type of criminal punishment and because it's Henry's car that Charles was driving plot twist Henry's gonna have to go to court too to testify against Charles he has to basically say Charles took my car without my knowledge because if Henry says yeah I let him drive my car then Henry can be complicit in the act so it's like ah that's gonna make this worse. I can see it coming in 4K. So they leave the court and Richard's like, all right, whatever, I'm gonna go. And Charles is like, hey, you know, I'm feeling really down. Do you wanna walk back with me? And Richard is like, okay, whatever, fine, I'll walk back with you. I love you, I'm just pissed off at you. So they're walking back and Richard's like, what happened between you and Henry? Like, you need to tell me the truth. I'm a good friend, I was here for you. So Charles starts to spill the beans and he's like, I'm just sick of Henry's demands. I swear I blame Henry for everything. I blame Henry for the plan to kill Bunny. I blame Henry for the Bacchanal with the farmer. He put us all in this predicament. And he's like, in addition to putting us all in this predicament, there was something I never told you guys that the FBI said. And Richard's like, what? What did I say about secrets, Charles McCauley? So he's like, yeah, okay, well, the FBI, get this. They knew about Henry and Bunny's fight in Italy and they knew about Henry's book ticket for all of us to go to South America and Richard's like excuse me why did nobody tell me this and Charles is like well Henry was pretty sure that he was gonna get arrested Henry was shaking and shitting and scared he thought that he was gonna go to jail and Richard is starting to side eye Henry like okay hold on a minute what do you mean you're tired of his demands because Henry has been telling me to go here and do this and buy this and see this so now Richard's like was Henry plotting what does Henry have up his sleeve so now Charles is sowing seeds of doubt in Richard's head about Henry and Richard is like I don't know who to trust at this point so Richard is like you know what Charles you're right I believe you I feel like this kind of was Henry's plan and he got us in this predicament and he's kind of just giving Charles a pep talk and they go back to the twins apartment and they walk in and Charles sees Camilla and he walks up to her and he's like hey how about a kiss for your jailbird brother and grabs her and they aggressively start making out. Richard is stunned shooky he immediately thinks back to the time that bunny called camilla out and how that was the one thing that got under her skin and he is like whoa i gotta go see ya have fun i'm glad you're out of jail and he runs to francis's house because he's like listen i need answers so he goes to francis and he says do charles and camilla have a relationship more than brother and sister and francis is like yeah like he laughs he's like wait duh they do and everyone has known that for a long time like have you not picked up on it have you not seen it and he's like oh they're so jealous of each other they're exceptionally jealous that's why you've never seen charles with a woman camilla is so jealous but charles charles is really 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 jealous he is very possessive and richard is just taking this all in like oh my god and he's just remembering all these times with charles and camilla like he said when he first saw them he thought they were dating how they always wear white he's thinking about the now and how that's an intimate situation and the siblings were both there she was the only girl he's putting two and two together and while his mind is racing francis is like oh yeah i slept with charles too charles will never admit to it but i've been with him too you know what i mean like it is what it is and Richard's like oh my gosh y'all really don't just read Greek y'all live a Greek life then he thinks about Bunny talking about how the Greeks got it on with their siblings all the time and he is like I I just have to go I have to go have a good night and Francis is like bye and Richard just walks home like what did I get myself into Richard is just kind of doing his own thing and one day he's walking to class just about a mind and old business and boom he sees Cloak and Cloak's like hey Richard what's up like have you been to Camilla's new house and Richard's like what are you talking about every time I leave my house there is another thing another development that I am not knowing about and Cloak's like yeah I saw Henry moving um Camilla's stuff out of the twins apartment and like putting stuff into his car like I just assumed like they were moving or whatever Richard's like huh where'd they move and Cloak's like well I actually don't know I just saw that they were moving and Richard's like okay that's super sus and Cloak is like yeah I don't trust Henry very sus and Richard's like, wait, I thought you liked Henry. And Cloak's like, no. Well, spoiler alert, when I talked to the FBI agents, I felt like Henry was trying to pin that whole bunny NYC drug thing on me, point them in my direction. Cloak's like, all I'm saying is, 
when I was talking to the FBI guys, your name came up. And I can't be sure of it, but I am sure of it that Henry gave it to them. And Richard is ticked at this. He is thinking, he is like, hold on, now I'm starting to paint a picture. I'm the only one with no alibi. I was supposed to be at a movie with Bunny the night of the farmer thing. Richard, he told me to go see two movies back to back. Told me to buy this paint. He is starting to think, did Henry set me up as the fall guy? Have I been the chump this whole time? Am I the next Bunny? And Richard is not doing good. But also he has so much love for these people and he knows that there have been so many times that they could have easily thrown him under the bus. He also remembers that they let Richard walk away after they confessed. He knows that Henry let him walk away after Richard knew everything because Henry trusted that Richard wouldn't do anything. Well, obviously, because he just like successfully indoctrinated you into his cult. But Richard is like, he's my friend. He gave me the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to just give him the benefit of the doubt. Do some more investigating. Cloak is like, okay, well, I'm going to see you later. Do you want to hang out tonight? And Richard's like, cool, yes. Let's go to a party. So later that night, Richard, Cloak, and Judy Poovy go to a party with, again, Sophie Deerbold, the girl who found Bunny's body. So Richard passes out and he just gets obliterated and wasted and Sophie comes to check on him and she's like, I wanna make sure you're okay. And Richard's like, yeah, thank you so much. You're actually like a sweetheart. He's like, did we sleep together? And she's like, no, don't worry. I just wanted to make sure you're okay. And Richard is really troubled by the fact that somebody so sweet was traumatized by finding Bunny, who was also her friend. Before he can even like process this, Francis comes running in his room and he says to him, important news, my friend, but he says it in Greek so that Sophie can't understand and she's like, okay, bye, whatever. Richard is like, okay, what was so important that you needed to interrupt me in my conversation? And Francis is like, well, we located Camilla. She's staying at a really, really, really expensive inn in the countryside that only one Mr. Henry Winter could afford. Charles is incensed because Camilla has cut off all conversation with him, all communication, and he doesn't know how to get a hold of her. He doesn't know where exactly where she's staying or what room. Francis is like, this is terrible because Charles is just gonna drink more and be more angry and cause more of a ruckus until he finds her. But they're like, okay, but why would Henry do this? And Richard's like, well, okay, obviously, they're sleeping together. And Francis is like, yeah, you're right. Uh, it's been pretty clear that something's been going on between Henry and Camilla for a while. And Richard remembers all those times where he saw them coming down sleep ruffled. Remember the secret code that they had, ring once, hang up twice, all that malarkey. And the way Henry picked her up that day at the lake when she cut her foot and all the pieces are coming together to the puzzle. And they're like, okay, this is not going to end well. So Francis is like, I will keep you updated if I find out anything about Henry and Camilla because I can't get a hold of Henry. So you do the same. And Richard's like, okay, I'm going for a night walk. This has stressed me out. Y'all are stressing me out. And on his walk, what does he see? You know, when he's supposed to be fine in peace, talking to God, but Charles passed out on a playground. And I'm not talking about drunk passed out. Like he is not doing good so Richard wake, tries to wake him up and he kind of comes to and he's like okay come on let's go let's go I'll take you back to my room and Richard takes him back and over the next few days it's really just Richard taking care of Charles and he is not doing good he has a really high fever he's super dehydrated he won't eat he won't drink any water and he keeps hallucinating Bunny and Richard is really upset by this and Charles is always thinking that Bunny's in the room and he's crying and he's apologizing. Richard is like, okay, you are not getting better so we are gonna have to go to the hospital. Charles doesn't want to, but Richard's like, listen, I'm not losing you too. And Charles is like, okay. So they go to the hospital and the doctor is like, Charles is fine, he's not dying of like cirrhosis of the liver. He just has a wicked bad case of bronchitis. He's super stressed and super dehydrated. So his body is just giving out. He needs to sleep and sleep it off and get medicine. So Charles is out cold for like, I don't even know how many days. He regains consciousness. He's like, hey, go to my house, get my stuff, and get me a bottle of scotch. And Richard is like, Richard's like, I don't wanna get this man alcohol. Because now he's sober and conscious and he's sick, but he asked Henry and Francis what he should do. And this is the first time he's talked to Henry, so he is heated. And they're like, listen, just do what he says because you don't want him to go crazy. You don't know what he'll say. Could say something about Bunny. Could say something about the farmer. Could lose his mind. Just keep him happy. And Richard is starting to get that icky feeling in his stomach in the same way he did when Bunny was getting out of Henry's control. Richard leaves the hospital and meets up with Francis and they go to the twins apartment or I guess now just Charles's apartment get his stuff get his scotch and when they get back Charles is in a wicked bad mood he is just on 
sicko mode and Francis is like hey you know talk to Camilla and she's fine thinking that this will you know calm him down and Charles says I hope you told her I said go to hell and Richard is just like well okay on the way out of the hospital Francis is like listen I don't know what's going on but I feel like we should stay out of it because that seems like a big old mess two degrees and they go home for the night and he's like all right I'll see you later da -da -da -da. I'm gonna go home I'm gonna sleep opens his door to boom Camilla sitting on his bed Richard could not catch a break there was a time where he was trying to avoid them because he was curious then there was a time that he wanted to be so ingrained with him that he was annoyed at the idea of them avoiding him and now everywhere he turns he cannot escape them and he's like oh my god Hamden College is not big enough so Richard is ticked he's like why are you in my room he's being so cold to her he's really upset because he loves the twins but more importantly he has a really soft spot for Charles and he knows that Charles is going through it and he kind of puts all this blame on Camilla until Camilla kind of starts to explain what's been going on she lets Richard in on the fact that Charles has always been you know pretty aggressive and pretty controlling but ever since Bunny's funeral Charles has become physically abusive to her and Richard is kind of like skeptical but he can see in her face that she's telling the truth rolls up the sleeve of her arm to show cigarette burns and Richard is like oh my god crazy and he apologizes and he's like, I am so sorry that Charles was doing this to you. I had no idea. I wish I could help you. And she's like, yeah, Henry helped me. And as soon as she brings up Henry, he's enraged. He's immediately like annoyed again. And he's like, listen, you put too much faith in Henry. You think you know who he is and you don't understand him. And Camilla, like she doesn't understand why Richard is so upset. He's just going off on one and he's like, you think he's this good guy, you think he's your savior. And she's so confused as to why Richard is so upset. And obviously we know and the readers know it's because he's always had a thing for Camilla and always thought if she would choose somebody in the group, it would be him and that he wouldn't be third in line after her brother and Henry. So he is super upset and he just basically tells her to leave. He's kind of just shocked and she's hurt and she's like, all right, whatever, okay, I'll leave. The book is literally just like Richard's introspection. So the next few days are just him going over every encounter he's had with Henry since the moment he's met him and really looking over his motives and his intentions and seeing like, was I manipulated? With his whole entire world is crumbling. The social hierarchy he thought that this group had is crumbling around him. Richard is just going about his business and a couple days later Henry calls him and they get into it. Richard is annoyed and he's like I'm tired of you acting like our fearless leader. I'm tired of you acting like our boss. Yet you keep everybody in the dark. You always tell us what to do. I'm done with it. And instead of fighting back, Henry, Mr. Criminal Minds, says you don't feel a great deal of emotion for other people do you richard kind of gagged him a bit but is like no i do i'm very empathetic and henry's like i i don't think so because we told you about this farmer you could have turned us in you didn't do anything bunny was nothing but nice to you bunny was the reason you were in our group bunny convinced julian to let you in bunny is the one that was always leading your case he was the one nice enough to go to lunch with you yeah you were so easily convinced and Richard is kind of just gagged and he's like, okay, whatever. And Henry just takes it upon himself to be like, and you know what? I agree with you. He's like, I have felt dead inside my entire life. Or at least I thought I did until the night of the Bacchanal when we did what we did to the farmer. Richard is like, what? And Henry's like, yep, mm-hmm. That was the best night of my life because I was finally able to live without Thinking. And Richard is like, wow, you are a freaky, deaky, disturbed mother effer. And he's deeply disturbed by Henry, what Henry's saying, but he also knows the most messed up part about it is, is that Henry is right because a part of him feels the same way about the day what happened with Bunny happened. So Richard is like, all right, Henry, whatever, goodbye, I gotta go. But everyone is just off running amok. The two stable ones really are Francis and Richard, so they're like, listen, we need to go back to what we know. So they go to see Julian in the Lyceum, and they're just talking to him, hoping that he will lift their spirits. Well, I see him and they find Julian. He is looking at this piece of paper on his desk and they're like, oh, what's that? And he's like, oh, it's a letter that somebody slipped in my mailbox from Bunny. And they're like, what? 
So Julian is like, yeah, I don't think this is Bunny. And Richard and Francis are like, I don't know. This kind of looks like Bunny's crappy handwriting. And remember, Bunny's thing was leaving notes in your mailbox. Richard remembers this because this is how he asked him to go to dinner with him the first time they hung out. So they're kind of like, okay, whatever. So Julian opens it. There talks about the Bacchanal murder and Bunny basically expresses he is scared. Henry wants to him now that he knows about it. And Julian is like, there's no way this is real. This is a sick joke that somebody played on us. We already know that Edmund took his life. And Richard and Francis are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Turns it over, the letterhead says the Excelsior, and it is the place that Henry and Bunny stayed at in Rome. So now Francis and Richard know this was sent from Rome. Julian doesn't know where they stayed, but they know Julian is smart, and he's going to put two and two together. So they're like, we got to get this letter out of his office somehow because if he goes back to this if he even examines it for more than five seconds without us in front of him to distract him we're cooked so they try to like lure him away from the letter and entice him around the classroom and ask him things he is not taking the bait they are looking all over for henry because they know henry has a key to julian's office and they're like we need to find him and they're looking all over and they circle back to the lyceum and they realize that henry is in julian's office and richard bursts through the door and urges Henry to talk to him in private and he says hey I need to talk to you it's really important and Henry is like go away I'm not talking to you and kind of treats him like a peasant arrogantly kind of like condescendingly declines him and Richard is like are you kidding me I don't have time for this so he's begging he's like please come in the hallway talk to me as soon as Henry says yes he moves his hand and gets up and Julian and all of them see the top of the letterhead saying Excelsior, the hotel in Rome that Henry was talking about, him and Bunny staying at. And Richard talks about the fact that a moment of silence just infiltrated Julian's office and he just watched every single person connect the dots at the same time. And he just watches Henry realize that they cannot lie to Julian anymore. So he tells him everything from the farmer to bunny and richard says when henry finished the expression on julian's face was impossible to read and all julian does is look around the room and look around the lyceum with this unreadable expression and he looks henry dead in the eyes and he says i think you better keep this and then he walks out of the room and richard lets us know that this is the last time he ever sees julian in person when he goes back to his office and to talk to George Lefleur about what happened. Julian no longer teaches at the college. He has left, his office is cleared out, and the Lyceum is empty. And he has this moment where he's like this magical place full of Moroccan rugs and tea and, and fairy lights and all of this stuff. This is just a classroom. Like the magic of Hamden and the magic of this classroom was what we were doing together and the moment we decided to betray one of our friends is the moment that we destroyed it and Richard is super upset about this and he talks about Julian and he says future Richard talks about how he thinks about Julian in the present and he's like I can't really bring myself to love or hate him you know he says on one hand he finds Julian silly and vain and often cruel but on the other hand he knows that Julian is an amazing teacher and he helped them all grow, especially Richard. And he also really saved them from going to jail for life. <laughs> Two murders. And he ultimately says that he has love for him. So the next day, Charles is released from the hospital and they go and pick him up and they head to class. And in the room, again, is not Julian, it is the Dean. Dean says that because of Julian's absence, the classic department is going to be dissolved, although he is going to find them a substitute for the rest of the semester. And this is kind of the final shattering blow to their group. They are all just distraught. And Charles bursts through the door and he's like, where is Julian? Where is Julian? He's losing his mind. And the dean re-explains the situation to him because again he's drunk because when they got out of the hospital they took him to lunch and he didn't even order food he just ordered alcohol so he's wasted and charles is livid he is just absolutely at his boiling breaking point because he's like julian leaving is all henry's fault all of this being destroyed is all henry's fault and he just cannot take it anymore he is absolutely seeing red so obviously henry and charles have to be together because they're in class so they are trying their very best to get along especially considering charles court case is coming up where henry has to be at so the next day they all come to class and they have a substitute who is 
terrible at Greek and Charles isn't there. Everyone's like, okay, whatever, we're just gonna do this. We're gonna get to the class. And halfway through, Charles stumbles in drunk out of his mind. They're like, okay, we're not doing this. So get through that class and Henry is like, I'm never going back to class. I don't care if I fail. I don't care if I get kicked out of school, I'm done. And Charles is just like, yeah, of course you feel like that, Mr. Moneybags. Of course you feel like that, Mr. I make the rules. And he is super upset and they are just bickering. And Richard is like, this is not going to go well they have to go to court together and if they fight like this in court this is going to be bad for Charles bad for Henry Richard and Francis are like we need to do whatever we can to get Charles to calm down he's reminding us a lot of buddy want to come for a ride for us let's go to the country house let's relax let's have fun because they know Charles loves the country house and he is so drunk and so paranoid at this point he thinks that they're setting him up for Henry to be there and for it to be this big intervention and they're like listen Charles we love you we are your friends we are not trying to hurt you we love you and we want the best for you and that kind of calms him down and mollifies him and they drive out to the country house and they think everything's going to be fine but when they get there Charles just stalks off alone and spends his entire time drinking and they're like okay this drinking is getting out of hand this is not good he everywhere he goes he's reminded of bunny he can't handle it they just let him do his thing and later that night henry calls and charles overhears henry's voice and flips out he is assured plotting his demise and that henry is going to be coming over and that he's going to be the next bunny runs out of the country house steals the neighbor's truck starts driving drunk back to hamden town mind you charles's license is suspended because he just got a dui that he hasn't even gone to court for so they're all freaking out including henry because they're like if we don't find him before the police find him he is going to jail and he is so drunk and he is so upset he might just spill the beans and implicate us all so everyone is losing their mind richard and francis look for charles everywhere but they can't find him and eventually they're like listen let's just go to the album tomorrow where camilla is because hopefully if we can get camilla and get charles back and they go there do a little like espionage and pretend that they already know the room and pretend that their name's henry winter and they get the room number and they go and knock and richard's like it's me open the damn door and in the room is henry and camilla and richard is just like great perfect henry's like listen we don't have time for y'all to be jealous okay we need to figure out how we can find charles and they start to strategize about going to look for him and before they can even get a plan on paper boom charles bursts through the room drunk as a skunk super angry and holding a gun and they are like oh my god what are you doing and he's pointing it right at henry and he tells henry that he's come to kill henry for ruining his life richard is like oh my god what do i do this is my worst nightmare and Camilla is just going through it. Charles is holding the gun. Francis, Richard, Camilla, and Henry are all trying to calm him down. They're standing out with their hands out. So they decide to charge him and they manage to struggle the gun out of his hands and it goes off hitting Richard and shooting him in the gut. So Richard is laying on the ground shot in the gut and absolute chaos is happening. People are banging on the door. They hear police sirens down below. Charles is like, oh my God, oh my God, Camilla's crying. And in this moment, Henry just is calm as a cucumber and he grabs a gun off the floor and he says, come here to Camilla. For a second, she hesitates and she looks really scared of him. And he looks at her and he just tilts his head and he's like, you think I would hurt you? And in that moment, she like snaps out of it and steps towards him and he whispers something in her ear. Donna Tartt has never let us know what he whispered in her ear, although some speculate it's live forever or I love you. And then Henry puts the gun to his head and takes his own life just as the innkeeper and the police enter through the door. So Henry basically takes the rap for it. So Henry basically sets the scene that they all have an alibi, that he was trying to commit suicide. They were trying to stop him. And in the process, Richard was accidentally shot. This narrative has spread so much that when Richard is in the hospital, Mrs. Winter actually comes to him and thanks him for trying to save her son and Richard now realizes that Henry sacrificed himself for their safety. He will go down as suicidal, so hurt and distraught by the death of Bunny suicide that he could not live without his friend. And Richard is just, just does not know what to think about all this. In Henry's memory, Mrs. Winter gifts Richard Henry's car and Richard is very moved by this and he's very happy to have such a big piece of Henry with him and he realizes what a good friend, you know, Henry was to them. So he spends the rest of his time in the hospital and when he gets out, 
it is summertime and he goes off to Brooklyn and he spends his time in Brooklyn reading and healing and just being able to be alone and think about all that he did and the people that he met in his year at Hamden College. But in the fall, Richard returns to Hamden and although two of them have left us, none of the other classic students aside from Richard come back to school and Richard continues going to Hamden and eventually gets a degree in English and he is the only one of Julian's former students to graduate from Hamden College. Richard does not keep in contact with anybody except for Sophie Deerbold who he ends up actually dating during his senior year of college and together the two of them move back to California. They try to date but their relationship doesn't work because Sophie says Richard is uncommunicative and she's scared of the way he looks at her. He wakes up and Richard is like, yeah, I'm severely traumatized and never gonna be the same. So she probably made the right choice. So Richard is like, I don't know what to do with myself if I'm not in school. So I'm gonna go to graduate school and in school he studies Jacobian tragedies and he really enjoys it. Jacobian tragedies are really full of violent deaths and guilt stripping characters and they tend to focus on revenge, justice, you know, get your dick back. He is really interested in learning about something other than classic Greek and he's just working, he's just living and he's writing his dissertation and one day he gets a letter from Francis and he is really excited to open it until he realizes that it is essentially a suicide note and Richard is like, uh-uh. I'm not gonna lose another one of y'all so he travels to Boston even though he hasn't seen Francis in years and when he gets there he finds out that Francis in the hospital after a failed attempt he goes to visit Francis and he's like you stupid stupid boy why would you do this and Francis let us know that he wanted to take his life because his grandfather found out that he is gay and is forcing him to marry a woman and not only a woman but a woman he finds physically and mentally repulsive says if I refuse my grandfather will cut me off and won't give me any more money and I don't think I can live without my inheritance and Richard finds himself extremely annoyed at this really annoyed that he got a second chance at life while Bunny and Henry didn't and Francis is so willing to take his because he cannot live without money. He thinks that Francis should give up his inheritance for a chance to live a happy free life and he can't understand the way that they still cling to wealth after all these years. The next day he is still chatting with Francis and he's kind of in a better mood and in walks Miss Camilla and Richard is kind of stunned and they have this little heartfelt brief reunion and Camilla just kind of sits down and updates them. She lets them know that he doesn't talk to Charles anymore. They're no longer on speaking terms and she doesn't even know where he is or where he lives and as far as she knows he is in Texas living with a woman that he meant in rehab and both of them still regularly relapse and drink and this is really upsetting to Richard and he takes it really to heart and he thinks about Charles and how he wishes he would come walking through the door and it would be a full reunion. And Camilla goes on to talk about her life basically revolving around her grandmother who was sick and on the verge of death and she just takes care of her and Richard is so depressed by how the twins life turned out and as they turn to leave Richard ever the trier Ever the mirror ball wants to save Camilla one last time from her life and asks her to marry him. And Camilla looks at him and she's really sad and she's really devastated and you think maybe is she going to say yes, maybe is she going to say no. She can't because one, she has to take care of her grandmother and then two, says that she is in love with Henry and she will always be in love with Henry. But Richard is really heartbroken and this is just the final realization that he was never going to have a chance with Camilla. It was never going to be you. It was never going to be you. And he is really dejected and he returns back to California. And this is the ending of our book. Richard basically ends his story by relating it to a dream that he had recently saying this dream took place in a strange and deserted city underpopulated by war or disease. He talks about this city and in it there's this museum like building where men are standing around and they're looking at this exhibit. He says the exhibit is a machine with metal parts that slid and collapsed in upon themselves to form new images. An Inca temple. Click click the pyramids the pantheon. The Parthenon. Richard is just looking at the exhibit and he's really enamored by it in his dream and then all of a sudden he looks up and he sees Henry and Richard asks Henry if he's happy 
where he is and Henry replies that he is not and he also says to Richard you're not very happy where you are either and Richard just takes us in apparently on the pyramids they all start to merge into different cities like Plano and San Francisco Hamden town and as they start to fuse Henry excuses himself and walks down a long gleaming hall towards the light and the book ends with that that is the secret history by Donna Tartt it is a roller coaster I feel like one fifth of the book is like beautiful dark academia friends in the countryside rich people shenanigans and the rest of it is like utter utter chaos I have so many opinions and I have so much love for this book I have so many videos about it on TikTok pursuit of beauty no matter the cost and I love the cult themes and I love how we are indoctrinated into hating bunny and then programmed and realizing you know what was wrong and we really get sucked into this world in the same way that Richard does and because he's such an unreliable narrator it's super fun to look through and find clues that kind of negate stories that he said or kind of disprove other things that other people have said or done. Now you don't have to read it. You can just pretend like you're super smart, esoteric, and you're just a coquette queen, Lana Del Rey vinyl, Ethel King Court. <laughs> that sentence would literally send a pilgrim into anaphylactic shock. Anyways, now you know The Secret History by Donna Tart. Comment down below, let me know what you thought. If you've read it, let me know what your favorite part was, any theories. Ah. I love to discuss my theories. And I'll see you guys all in the next video. Bye.